Hello everybody, welcome to Yeshua Network. It is another entire Bible read-through. I'm Nathan Wheeler. I'm Alex Lovovsky. Woo woo! Woo! Second Samuel 17 through 24, finishing up the Samuels. Pretty blessed. Uh, thank you guys for putting in the time to read and your comments were amazing as always. And uh, I thank the Lord for you and your contribution to this channel and this network and also this the work that you do for the entire Bible read through blesses us all. So thank you guys very much for everything that you do and for being here. I hope that also the message of this of this uh, these chapters really speaks to you, and I hope that the Lord is moving in you and increasing you every day. Hallelujah. Um, yeah. So let's get started. All right. Here we go. We are we are pumped. We're ready to roll. Um, General. Real quick, is that uh, is that the first question that we should take? Oh, uh, where do we go to the next one? Uh, yeah, no, we can. Eddie okay. Hernandez says, I have a question. When we say amen, I thought it meant true. Uh, so who is amors? Well, amors doesn't mean amen. Uh, amen is, you know, how they say it. But uh, amen means I am in agreement or so it is so. Like, there, it's, like a, it's like a way of saying I am in agreement. So that's, that's what amen means. Like, with all my... With all my agreement that I could offer up, may it, may it be so in the Lord. Like, that's what amen means. It's kind of cool, actually. Amen. 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 <laughs> okay. First question, or uh, second general question, candy can do. I don't understand why so much killings, murders, and death. I'm also having a hard time understanding what I'm reading. A good many things just don't really make sense to me. I'm not sure if it's the way it's written or how they used to talk or what. I always seem to be confused when reading the Bible, and it gets a little frustrating. Do you have any suggestions? I don't want to get discouraged from reading, but sometimes it's really hard since I don't really understand. Maybe, a lot, maybe I'll understand and can comprehend a little better when we get to the New Testament, but we still have quite a ways to get through in the Old. Again, I don't want to get discouraged from reading. Your Sunday read-throughs and meetups here have really helped, but when I'm reading during the week I get so confused and don't understand a lot of what's happening and going on and again why so much death and killing thank you very much for giving us your time and wisdom Alex and Nathan and as well as the rest of the group too I'd be totally lost without all of you amen well <clears throat> go ahead will you got something no I just, you took a breath I didn't mean to cut you off well Kenny no, let just... me just tell you first it's completely normal what you're experiencing yeah. that I think is the first thing to say which is why We're the entire this. Bible read through is happening and in the manner it is happening um, the thing is is a lot of times we read something in the Bible and, and this may not be what you're talking about Candy it might just be me but I remember the first time I, I read the Bible pre-believing pre, pre being a believer and I, I was reading through it and I thought a lot of the same things that you're saying like well if he's God why is this per why are they all killing each other why are they falling away so fast why are they giving up on him so fast if he's their God this doesn't make any sense and it would confuse me and the thing I, I think that happens is, is that because we don't like what we're hearing we actually think that we're confused but I think that in reality you're getting it I think your confusion isn't always that you're not understanding the words. I think it, it might be that you're actually not understanding the people or the scenarios. Why do people kill? Why, do, why did Hitler do the Holocaust? If, if you read about it, it's not that you're confused in your reading comprehension. You're confused because you're thinking to yourself, why the heck did somebody do this and where was God in it? And I think that that's a completely normal thing to experience. And, and again, I might be wrong. You might actually saying your reading comprehension of the Bible is is poor. Uh, but And that's also normal because especially if you're reading it in Elizabethan. Um, for myself, when I get to those times and I get to those places in the Bible where I got confused or I get frustrated and I don't understand, what I, what I do, especially in the modern time, is I will research every sentence. I will take a look at what are like study notes of every passage that I'm confused about. I take my time with it. I'm not in a hurry to, to blast through it. And so when you do this, you kind of will learn uh, the language in a weird way, right? You notice that? So there is a language. There's this Elizabethan language, but then there's also like this Hebrew language and you get to actually learn the culture of how the Bible was written. Like, What's very strange is that the Bible has a voice, as, as in the professional writing world, you can tell when somebody else has written another 
a book or different chapters of a book because the voice of it changes and you can kind of pick that up the more in depth you go and the more you kind of research the things you're confused about um, so that's my only two cents does that make sense yeah um, I think also when you look at the people we're reading about um, why so much killing and why so much death we're reading about kings we're reading about leaders of nations but they're not nations um, like we have. They're literally nations with wooden and mud huts like nations. Maybe right. some stone. But but I mean, how are they in any way, shape, or form worse than the killing that happens in the modern world or used to happen very shortly, like you just mentioned World War II? Leaders of nations get together and, annihilate. and have wars and annihilate one another. And then power centers. Like right now, we're reading all about the drama of being a king. Everybody... Is they're either trying to kiss the king's butt, or when they figure he's not the king anymore, they're going to try and kill him, kill him, <laughs> take his throne. So it's like this. The reason why this extra drama is it's power, power dynamics, right? This is what this is unfortunately what people are going to do when left alone and, and given uh, and given any kind of earthly power. Which is one of the reasons why the, the Lord had said to the Israelites, "You don't want a king. Believe me, you don't want a king." This is not going to work out well for you. So, <sighs> yeah. So um, now as far as, you know, so that we're reading about the most dramatic aspects worthwhile telling of the story so that we can right. glean from those. But then there's books that, that don't touch any of that, like Ruth. Remember mm -hmm. how nice it was to read that and we're like, oh, finally, a book about people who do right and do well and they're humble and they're meek and they're this and they're that. And you realize, okay, that's still a large percentage of the world is that way and even in these ancient, ancient cultures. Um, but about not understanding, I think I agree with you 100% in, the, in that sometimes we read it, mm -hmm. it says what it says, and we can't figure out why the story went in that direction, right. or why, why, would, why would this be the case, and we figure we don't understand. Um, we misread or whatever. So um, slowing down is literally a must. We, we must. have to do it. Because we're reading together, and it really does help when you read with someone. It does. Um, both of you kind of, or if you're in a group, everybody participates in stopping when someone or something is confusing or someone is confused. And then if both people happen to be confused about a passage, then it's extra gravy because everybody attacks it, you know, and starts to try and figure it out and discusses it and all of that. So... We get that it's harder to do alone. When I first read, my first time reading of the Bible, even as a believer, I was also a little shocked and it's slightly, I wouldn't say put off, because I was like, where's all this going? Well, I knew where it's going. It's going to Yeshua, so I guess it huh. makes sense. Like, look how dramatic the solution to all of this is, right? right. <clears throat> so I knew where it was going, but I did notice, like, the, <laughs> just constant, you know, people are getting killed and the sin and the, the falling away. It, it's just relentlessly... It breaks your heart. It breaks your heart. Yeah, and, and we, we actually read that in the comments today. There's people who have, have said, or they've written me in emails at least uh, recently in the last few weeks saying, that, you know, it's so sad to see how they fall away or how quickly they fall away. I know I read that comment somewhere. Somebody had yeah. just written said, and said, it's, it's amazing how quickly they seem to fall away. You also have to understand, though, too, when we say quickly, we're reading like, yeah. and there was blessing and there was thing. And then the man took the horse and he, whatever. And like, it's like the next 40 sentence. years have gone by in those sentences. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, it, it, and it's not like we don't quickly stumble ourselves, I, I don't think. Yeah. Um, look, look. <laughs> yeah. We, we have plenty of, uh, plenty of uh, experiences being captured on video in this series of us. Uh, you know, saying something out of line or, or maybe uh, being too funny or whatever. So, yeah. Well, Candy's, Candy, I see you're, you're talking here. I'm stopping on every line and most of the time I just can't figure it out and it doesn't make sense. All right, well, another thing you can try and use is if you've got eSword, yeah. um, you can try and download other versions of the Bible, which you got to be careful because sometimes they're totally inaccurate. Um, but there are plain English versions. But they'll give you the general arc. But they'll give you a general arc. And then that's sometimes what you need. Is It's kind of like you'll be... I, I think if I understand what you're saying now, we even do that. Yes. Yeah, we do that. So we just so you totally know, we do, do that. that. We'll read the King James. And, you know, I grew up reading Shakespeare. So I'll read the King James and I'll understand what it's saying. But I'm like, well, which is it? Is it that the guy was allowed in the tent or was he not allowed in the tent? Right. Is it that it was his brother who did this or was it his cousin? Like you're like, I don't understand what it's saying. So if that's what you're talking about, what I do like to do is I go to other scriptures or I click on the number. You know, like I, I'll show you. 
if I go to this, we, we did it on this read through, by the way, where we actually had to click one by one on every single number next to it to see what the actual meaning was. Yeah. And, and that's what I really rely on myself first and foremost. And if you, if you even have to take a pencil and paper and highlight the number, put your mouse, as you see here, my mouse is moving, you put your mouse over it and you guys can't see it, but there's a box that will pop up and it will tell you what the word was, the Hebrew word was, or the Greek word when we get to the New Testament, and it will give you a definition. And if you just write out the words on a piece of paper and then read those definitions, you'll get an actual true understanding of what happened. And, and for us, that's what our go-to is. And we find that that's how we get most of uh, the clarity when we get confused, yeah? Yeah, totally. But, so, but again, we, like Nathan said, we occasionally when that's not enough to give us a, enough of a solid answer, we'll, uh, we'll go to other scriptures, check those out. We'll check out the Septuagint. We'll check out uh, some plain English Bibles. Yeah. We'll hit up the internet and see what people are saying about it. And yeah, uh, it, it is easier when there's more than one person involved in reading. And we uh, never, and when we so. do do the research to look at like, for instance, what would be considered like study notes from somebody, a, a, a scholar or somebody has a blog or even like somebody, ha we, you know, what I'm saying is there's just all sorts of materials out there that you can get for free on the internet. Real quickly, we, we won't just read one and be like, oh, that makes sense. We look at a couple of different things or we take a look and we actually will research the, the thing is, is that when we do research, this is how we do it. We research the way we think it's saying, we research the way we think it could be saying, and we research like the opposite of what we think it's saying, just to see what pops up. And we, we do all that research per sentence or per paragraph or, or, or whatever that we're confused about. And we don't get off that pa paragraph or that sentence until we come to a place where like we genuinely feel the Holy Spirit has confirmed in us, this is this is good. This is you have a good understanding. You can move forward, and that's it. We we've stayed two hours, three hours, legitimately, you guys, on one chunk of something that we were frustrated or confused about. So when we get to the video on Sunday, that's the thing is we may seem like oh fresh recall. Well, that's because we just spent the whole week doing a whole bunch of work on eight to six chapters. And I know some of you also complain about how we're moving so slow, but you guys, it's the word of God. And, and me and Alex have actually talked about our speed and we've actually prayed about, do should we go faster or should we go at the speed that we're going? And basically we feel that the speed we're going is better for the long-term result because each one of these videos are a, a tool for other people that will come later to watch and learn about the Bible. And you, that's why I thank you guys so much for your work. So slow and steady wins the race. And, and I think that maybe that's the thing is you think you can just read through and, and get it, but it's a study, it's a thing you're studying right. to. And the Bible even says that, you guys, it says, you know, study thyself to be approved, not just read thyself to be approved. You know, you're not just, my eyeballs have graced over a word, so therefore I'm approved. It's a, you gotta, you gotta dig deep, get your elbows dirty and, and, and really research it. So. One of the benefits of it being such a difficult read mm -hmm. is, yes, you'll stop on a lot more things and sometimes you're like, oh, I wish this was just clearer because it's not one of those mind-blowing things. It's just a piece of the story. Right. But sometimes you'll stop on something and it'll blow your mind on when you discover what it actually means and what it's pointing to. Yeah. And it is because of the difficulty of the reading you get into a habit of doing that. And you... Um, that's what we're finding to be the case. Yeah. So now that we've been taught to see, yeah. like sometimes you won't understand, and when you do, you will be your life will your understanding of all of this will never be the same, right? Because we've been given that, and we all have been given that through this Bible uh, read through. Um, it, it's it's not. I don't. I, I'm not bogged. I don't feel bogged down by oh, here's another thing we don't understand. Let's I get, get excited. This. We get excited. We literally get excited when we get to the passages that confuse us yeah. because it's almost like God's way of saying, "Hey, there's a secret here, but yeah. I'm going to make you work for it." So exactly. So if you get to a point where you're like in a in a book that's filled with a whole bunch of like, it, technically it would be frustrating to read. In reality, it's God saying, "There's a secret here." All these like every single time. Every single time there's ever been a, like a really confusing or something's not worded right, there's been an unbelievable revelation for us, uh, you know, at those points. So that's another thing too that I, I have found that I think kind of has been the reason why this whole Bible, the Bible read through and the way we're doing it and the, and the, the reason why I'm so 
I'm so adamant about people reading the Bible for themselves was because I studied all these other religions before getting to the Bible and, and I had I had to, you know, research their culture and research what what part of the world were they in? What was the what was the buildings like? What was the food like? What was the clothing like? I would do all this research when I, I studied these other religions and these other uh, faith systems and stuff that by the time I got to the Bible, I already had those habits. And so it's when you read the Bible that way and you're not in a rush and you're literally doing it because you want to know, if you kind of relax about it, it, that's, it becomes fun. That's my big long point yeah. is that there is a joy about actually discovering it and, and doing the work. It's just a very long journey. It's yeah. a very long meal. I it's mean, a very, yeah. You know, the, yeah. There's millions of courses, I guess. And I'm glad to be reading so many people saying, or please don't speed up, you're at the right speed. So good. We're glad that other people feel but the same. Candy, again, we're, we're, we're giving you pointers, we're giving you our ideas, and we may sound like we figured it all out. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is, your experience of reading a Bible is exactly the same as everybody else. Yes. Um, Including and us. That's and why, that's why this is here. That's mm -hmm. why we're all doing this, is yeah. so that hopefully we can ease each other's frustrations and help each other see and understand more. Yeah. That's really it. And as many times as I've read the Bible, I tell Alex, this read-through, because we are going so slow, and because we are accountable, because we're all sharing information. Like, I don't know about you guys, but for us, for sure, I, I think I can speak on your behalf on this because we talked about it, is that we aren't reading it to just be fed. We're reading it because we're like, what is going to come up in the conversation? What is going to be asked on the video? What, on every single sentence, we're not only looking at it as what the Bible is saying, but what is somebody going to question about this sentence? What possible question yeah. can come up on this sentence? And therefore, we're looking at it with like a finer tooth comb than I've ever looked at it before. And the amount of growth and understanding I've had on this read through of the Bible is almost like so much that it's like I've never read the Bible before. That's how much more I'm getting on this read through. So I tell Alex all the time, I'm a little upset that he's getting it on you know the first read because. Well, this is my kind of second. Read. One point five. One point five. Yeah. So. Um, it's normal, is all we're saying. We're trying to encourage you. We give long answers. So Tiffany, real quick, uh, have you watched the Bible Buried Secrets? My friend did and says that it states that the Bible isn't as accurate as it proclaims to be. I told her not to believe everything that's out there as this could be an atheist that made this video trying to pull people away from God. Any thoughts? Tiffany, your, your instinct is right mm -hmm. to, to, to basically say, hold your horses. Why is this Bible Buried Secrets video film whatever suddenly the authority on whether the Bible is accurate or not accurate, right? Anybody could have an opinion. Mm -hmm. Um, Most of the time, I'm just going to chime in real quick. Go on ahead. That Most of the time, I, I'm going to say 100% of the time, I've ever had anybody bring me uh, something about the confusion of the Bible, the inaccuracy of the Bible. It was always the English version. I've never had anybody bring me up to this point in my life uh, saying, hey, this is what the original Hebrew text says, this is what the original Greek text says, and it doesn't make sense. It contradicts itself. It's, it's weird, or it doesn't make, like, I've never had that happen. And anytime somebody's brought me something where it's like, oh, but it says here it was, it was 10,000 horses, but over here it says it was 40,000 or 10,000 chariots, and over here it's 40,000 horses. And I was like, yeah, but in another passage it says each chariot was pulled by four horses. So now you understand why there's four 40,000 horses and 10,000 chariots makes sense so like these are the things that like most of the time that I've noticed it's an English problem or a translation problem of the original it's not the original so that's why I, we push that so much here so but I haven't seen it to answer your question I will check it out but mm, I mean we're in the second Samuel and so far I, I, I trust the Bible yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean uh, so you know I mean, yeah. <laughs> I like this. Sandy Vickers says, what's the rest anyways? I think I, we will be sad when it's done. <laughs> We're never going to be done. Once you're done with the first round, you're going back for a second round. Whoa, yes. Come on. Amen. All right. All right. Here we go. Okay. Priors. Priors. Doreen Anderson saying, just comment from 1426 regarding Absalom's hair. Whenever he cut the hair of his head from time to time when it became too heavy for him, he would weigh it and weighed about five pounds. Wowzers, how is that even possible? No wonder his head got stuck in the, in the oak tree. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> uh, very funny. Yeah, I don't know how that's possible. That boy had some, some hormone growth in him. That's got to be just, it's got to be just a testament of like, 
what it says about his perfection physically. Like, there's got to be some supernatural thing going on with this guy. Yeah, yeah, he's got to be having, like, something about his hair. Maybe the Lord gave him his hair to tempt him to be, like, praised by all the people. Yeah, I mean, like, the exactly. I mean, he plays the role of being, you know, uh, Adonis or whatever for the Hebrews. Mm -hmm. He plays the role of being the biggest movie star you can imagine, yeah. where everybody would fall away from following the righteous anointed king who kill, who slays giants and go after this guy because he's just so darn good looking. Yeah. Poor guy. <laughs> <laughs> so boy, I'm glad I don't have that problem. I mean, even if even if the 5 pounds is an exaggeration, guys, we certainly know what they're saying. Yeah. Right? Okay. It may not be though. May not be. I, that's the weird part is like there's never that it exaggerates for for the sake of making a point. Remember too though, there was a guy in the Bible who was so hairy that when his brother put on a goat skin, his father thought it was him. Exactly. So we don't know what kind of like hair situation on right. people was there. So you get what I mean? Right. We don't know. Maybe he had that gene in him where he was like a werewolf looking dude. So Right. I and mean, if, legitimately, maybe he thought that was handsomeness. <laughs> and listen, if, if, if there's six-fingered, six-toed giants, yeah. if there's uh, donkeys that talk to prophets, um, five pound hair is five pound hair. Possible. You know, snakes turn into Sn stabs, stabs and vice versa. Yeah, let's not trip over the five pounds. Okay, but we agree, it's we a agree. pretty miraculous thing. Yeah. Okay, Linda Eli, throw back to last week. I know we talked about the death of David's child with Bathsheba because of David's sin, but then I noticed this week that under Mosaic law, Deuteronomy twenty four sixteen, it was illegal to put children to death for their father's sins. Not that God is subject to the same laws as we are, but I thought this was interesting. That his sin was handled this way and so um you know i think there i'm gonna go ahead and read an answer that somebody posted to yeah. linda because it's it was so good awesome uh silmu hiltonen i hope i got your name right if you're listening new new person to the group yeah so welcome, welcome. or at least new to commenting commenting yeah. we would have remembered a name that we can hardly pronounce right uh, i read the passage second samuel 12 and got the following Nathan came and rebuked David of killing the living husband after taking his wife for himself. Now David says, I have sinned against Yahweh. And Nathan says, he passed by your wrongdoing, meaning those th sins are forgiven. Mm -hmm. Only after that adds he that because you enabled Jehovah's enemies greatly blaspheme him by this deed, you will also, or will also this son born of this deed surely die, which is totally in accordance with the first words that Jehovah Elohim uttered about surely dying in Genesis 2 to Adam. The day you will eat of that tree, you will surely die. By eating of the tree did Adam give dominion given to him by Elohim of the world to Satan, and so did also David. He gave Jehovah's enemies power and cause to take over and blaspheme Jehovah. This is why the son born of this deed had to surely die. In Hebrew, the wording is the same. In Genesis, mot tamut, and in David's son's case, mot yamut, where the first word mot is said to be infinitive absolute, and the second word carries mark of person. In Genesis, tamut, 2 p.m.s, and 2 Samuel, yamut, th 3 p.m.s. I hope that this does not mess you up more. Well, Silmu, that's a, a great answer, and... and uh, Obviously, you're looking at, again, the Hebrew to get full understanding and to figure out um, how to differentiate between God saying, you know, in under Mosaic law, children will not be executed for their father's sins. And you're bringing to the point that he's actually, that the child didn't have to die because of the father's sin, which was forgiven. The child had to die because he was the cause for the enemies of God to blaspheme and say, look what your anointed had done. Mm. Um, and so... Does that make sense? Yeah, I hope that makes sense. Later. Also, the thing is, too, is I perceive the child's death, and this sounds horrible. you got to remember where he's going, though, you guys. you got to remember where the child's going is much better than this hellhole and much better than the realm in which people are killing each other, sons are overriding their power to try to take the throne sooner than they would have otherwise. Uh, I, I saw it as a grace because the child would have been a bastard child. And, the chi and a bastard child has no place in Israel. Like, he's never going to be accepted. So that's, I, I saw it as God also showing grace on the child. And we'll get to why that's grace later on. I mean, we could go on to, to it, but I, we will read something in the Bible that for those who 
die in childbirth or those who die as babies and things like that. I perceive that there's a passage in the Bible that it has a special, God has a special plan for them. So I think we'll, we'll cross that road when we get there because I don't want to get away, get, it, get in front of us. Somebody left a good comment live here. I love this. Avia, am I saying your name right? Avia Feni, Feni? Just the fact that we are confused sometimes but want to understand shows how hungry for growth our hearts are. Amen. Amen. Exactly. Praise yeah. the Lord. So mm -hmm. the fact that we're reading despite the difficulty is a test in, in this day and age yeah. is a testament to the power of the Lord. I yeah. mean, come on. And we do do this too. Mickey Mackay, Whitfield Vargas says, I think that praying and asking the Holy Spirit to reveal it can be very beneficial when you become confused. Amen. We do that. Uh, I, I failed to mention that. So thank you very much, Miki, for, for commenting on that. We do do that. In fact, it's so autopilot kind of for us that like maybe that's why we never mention it. But yeah, yeah. That w you should definitely ask the Holy Spirit to give you understanding. and Because the Bible even says that the Holy Spirit is what gives understanding. So if you pray before you read, I have noticed that it seems like those readings are really blessed and that you just get really hit with a lot of, of, of growth. Let me put it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. And we need the help. I mean, despite the tools we have just talked about and da, 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 and all of these different versions it's still just information we need the help of the holy spirit to let us know when and and what to really vibe with and uh and sometimes you'll hit stuff that'll really mess with you yeah like so, like like we were talking about yeah so you read something in the bible that actually like you you almost like have to stop and in a weird way like mourn for the person like yeah. you were there or you really have to stop and allow the spirit to like convict you because you're like, man, I realize I did that and I never even knew I was doing something wrong or I never even knew I, I, I do that and I never even noticed I do it. Yeah. Like, there's all sorts of convictions and, and emotions that will happen. Or, or sometimes you'll read something that you have a really hard time believing. Just mm -hmm. a really hard time believing. Yeah, challenge your faith. Either. It'll challenge your faith. And, you know, and that, those are the moments where you need the help of some strength, mm -hmm. not of your own making, that keeps you in it. And pulls you through. And pulls you through and, and helps you wait to receive the answer when the time is right. And is it not true that when you get through it, you actually can feel like your faith is like increased. genuinely increased? Like you can feel the difference? Like you're like, now I'm so much more confident in my faith yeah. now that I got through that moment where my faith was tested. And that's an amazing thing too that we get from reading the Bible and, and reading challenging parts. So, mm -hmm. all right, thematic. Amazing. Yeah, it is amazing. Uh, Jill Cutler Higgins, unrelated to chapters, but David and Yeshua born in Bethlehem. Any coincidence or references to this? Yes. Yep. It's uh, prophesied that the Messiah would be born uh, in that part of the world. So yeah. we will get there. Yeah, but yes, absolutely. April Anglis, I'm wondering about the genetics of the giant six fingers, six toes, and this from the time of when the fallen ones... Is this from the time when the fallen ones came to earth and had relations with women? How much of the DNA is in the human race now? Were they a different species, weren't they? Uh, but now those in Yeshua, we don't have that in our DNA now, do we? The blood of the Lamb cleanses and alters very deep. Those are all very deep questions, some of them about mysteries we can only speculate about. Because Noah's sons married outside of like the Noah family, it is it is the theory that they carried those genes that's how they got past the flood if you will they were gene carriers of it right so that's how now we have like the super large uh folks that were of the time of the of the you know the the pre-flood people um and uh, is that living in us there's a chance yeah i mean we see some large folks today we see people who have mutations i mean is not a mutation also possibly a uh it's a genetic mutation. A genetic, so. Yeah, it's just a genetic thing. So, <clears throat> The thing about genes also is they're finding that genes change throughout your lifetime. And certain your own genes. genes. Add your own genes. And yeah. so based on your experiences. So genetics aren't like set in stone and that's what you're going to be. Your genes are actually like a computer code of everything that you are, at least in your flesh. And what you eat. And what you eat. And so uh, those do get passed on to your children. And, uh, and genes activate and deactivate throughout a lifetime in an organism. And humans have a tremendous amount of inactive genes that point to species that are not human. Mm -hmm. For example, there's reptilian DNA. Or fish or bird. Or, or fish or bird and stuff primates. like that. And that now, now, 
We can jump down those rabbit holes. I was going to say, are you about to go down a rabbit hole we're on about, It was very close to jumping down a rabbit hole, I which we're that. not going to do because there's so much to cover today. But um, maybe there'll be a video one day we can do a discussion about those specific rabbit holes and how they may relate to Genesis and, and, and how they may relate to even the Garden of Eden and the snake. Yeah. But and following your last question here is, or the, your statement, the blood of the lamb cleanses and alters very deep. I would say absolutely yes. Uh, I would say since our DNA can change and I think it's every seven years or something like that, that our DNA can absolutely be changed and so forth. I mean, when you have the joy of the Lord in you, your body is healthier, your mind is clear, you're more relaxed, you don't have so much anxiety. You, 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 you're, you're a different person. So when he says that you're a new creation, uh, I take that as both uh, literal and, metaf and, and symbolic. That we're a new creation in his eyes, that he doesn't see the sin and the old person we were before because we died through the baptism and we're born again. But also, I feel like a new person. It's amazing. So yeah, hallelujah. Doreen, how are, they able, how are the women able to give birth to those big babies? Well, they probably were just normal sized babies and yeah. just grew very large. Yeah, like Shaquille O'Neal didn't come out, you know, 22 pounds, <laughs> 50,000 ounces. So. Maybe, maybe he did, I don't know. <laughs> I actually, I read a thing where he was like a normal sized baby. He wasn't normal like a baby. huge ginormous baby. Right. Um, Stephanie gives a great, a great comment here. Stephanie Lamasters, real time. I've read things months ago that I was confused. And months later, I was revealed in a situation. That's happens a all the time. Drop. Come on. That happens Come all the on. time. That, that's been happening throughout this whole thing with us. Booyah. Totally agree. <coughs> yep. All right. Oh, look at that. Kim Canardi. Our cells are 100% replaced in seven years. I think that's what you're thinking. Yes. Thank you, Kim. That is what I was thinking. But our genetic code also goes changes, changes. though. Yeah, it does change, especially depending on what we put and in our body or what we're around radiation yeah, and what activates and doesn't activate. And, and, and you know, mind over matter, it, it does have your your outlook on life does have does have an effect on your genetics, believe and, it or not. And Ricardo, you are correct. Not that this matters, of course, but it kind of does in the sense of being born again and allowing Yeshua to change us. If you knew that you were changed, not just in your mind, and not just in your spirit, but even your body is changed. I think that's pretty miraculous. I think that's a pretty wonderful thing. I feel good about that. I feel good about knowing that the Lord has changed. I mean, look at me, you guys. When I was saying no to ministry, over five years, my health was decreasing, decreasing, decreasing till the day that I basically flatlined. And then I said, okay, I'm not fighting God anymore. And, and every year since, I was like, all right, Lord, what more do you want? What more do you want? What, what next do you want me to do? Or if you put something on my heart, I stopped fighting him. I'm like, all right, I'll do it. I'll do it. And my health has increased tremendously. I am healthier today than I've been in 12 years. That's crazy to think about. I'm older. I'm stronger. No, just kidding. You get my your point? biceps are growing. <sighs> by, your, by faith alone, your biceps have increased. What? Oh, am I pushing it up? My bad. Sorry. Oh, I was going to say, they really did grow. <laughs> Uh, Elizabeth, I want to answer Star. this. Elizabeth Star Westwood, not specifically Samuel. You may have already covered this, but I'm struggling with this reading and comprehension, still in Deuteronomy. See, not alone. I was fine in Genesis and slowly went to confusion. I'm not sure why. I haven't had a life-changing experience with Holy Ghost, but more so have lived with steady faith and belief. Little jealous of Alex. <laughs> Don't be jealous of me. And how he's picking this up like he is. I think you said you're fairly new to the faith. And I definitely feel a bit discouraged that I'm not digesting it on my own, although I feel so blessed hearing everyone else's contribution to the reading and so awoken. Thoughts? Maybe my age is limiting my understanding a bit. Thanks. Okay. Well. Go for it, bud. Uh, you know, you first this. of all, first of all, this. I had no, exp uh, this is, this is a, we don't want to create an expectation that every moment is going to be an aha moment. <laughs> and we don't want to create the expectation that Every time you get an aha moment, it feels like God has just shown up in your room and there he's standing. Um, that's how we describe it because we get so excited because I think by nature I'm a skeptic. And I think by nature Nathan is a skeptic. In fact, that's totally true. You could be proven by how much he studied to try and get to the truth. Mm -hmm. So being that we're by nature skeptics and being that we're reading this thing with like, yeah, really? this. X thousand year old book is really gonna you know there's a part that's like I'm still in doubt I, I, you still have to convince me he is well <laughs> the approach is one where we're not gonna give it a free pass right we're gonna attack the things we don't understand yeah. 
And when we do get a satisfying answer, we're blown away. And that's why our faith increases, because it's not normal, it feels to me, that you read an ancient manuscript and suddenly understand something about your life today, right? This is what we're taught as modern people, in that, that we're so smart, we know so much about the world, that there's nothing the ancient can't teach us. Mm -hmm. or there's nothing they can teach us that everything they know we already know and we've already went far beyond and that's just not true we nothing read the new Bible the and sun. nothing new under the sun it's confirming itself right. so Elizabeth um, you know don't there, there's something that me and Alex share that I, he's I, it's funny I was waiting for him to talk about it but it's something we've talked about and, and I want to say this that I think one of the greatest gifts the Lord ever gave me for reading remember if you guys know my story I was so bad at reading when I was a kid, they tested me for two days in the hospital to find out if I was mentally retarded or if I had autism, legitimately. I was so bad at reading and I had the worst reading comprehension that they tested me. I lived in a hospital for two days and they had wires to my brain and they made me wake up and sleep in the night and they made me like do things and draw things. It was, it was like I was crazy and I was like, whoa, madness. Wow, but the, the thing that taught me really, really how to read outside of Shakespeare, the thing that really allowed me to have the reading comprehension I have and to see things the way I see it is actually reading movie scripts. Um, because when you read a movie script as a director, specifically as a director, is that you don't read it as, what is it saying, what am I to learn? You read it and you say, he's standing in a room, and immediately you have to fill you have every to create the room. single inch of that room in your head and you have to what is he wearing what does he smell like what is he what is his emotion and as soon as as an actor you ask yourself what is the emotion of that the person is going through you have this backstory you either have to find the truth of if it's like based on a real character or you have to create it and so me and Alex both come from that background we were directors uh, we are actors in the in the film industry for many many years of our life we uh, have that our mind when we read we don't read like how I think most people read books we read like as if it's a movie script and 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 that I think also helps a lot and also Alex isn't reading it alone so <laughs> let me just let me just say that we, we read together literally we meet up and we read it together so uh, and we bounce ideas off each other. So that's the thing is if you are reading it alone, guys, and you are getting frustrated, um, that's why I'm talking about the, the f meeting up in real life, the fellowship in real life. It's next level. This Bible read-through is, is, in my opinion, the best formula that, that I have ever found, not maybe that can be created, but I have ever found for the internet fellowship of reading the Bible. I've never seen anything like this before and the dedication of so many people coming together to contribute. But could you imagine it in real life where you all got into a room, you all read out loud together in the room real time, and when some person, one person had an issue, nobody moved forward as a group on that passage until everybody in the room was like, we get it. Could you imagine how powerful that would be? So me and Alex have that with two. Imagine what it would be with a hundred. So anyways. And real quick about this, the attacking it or reading it as, a, as, as you would a movie script or a play. Um, yes, we're used to doing that. And yes, that the, all the details that are, that are absent from the script, which they have to be absent, by the way. That's one of the things they teach screenwriters. Don't give us any details that we don't need to give us. Mm -hmm. Give us the bare basics. Give us the dialogue. The director can create everything else. We, our minds are easily easily able to accept such a scenario and build reality out of it, but this is not to say that we're making things up as we're reading the Bible. Yeah. Um, when we are missing some form of detail we crucially need to have, we'll start doing research, obviously. Yeah. But then when our minds are able to quickly come up with something satisfying for both of us, we consider that to be a bit of a holy experience experience. And we're just encouraging you guys that if so, you find somebody, read with you. Yeah. That'd be awesome. It's a good contribution. That's what we're trying to say. Yeah. Okay. Somebody's asking, have we started the study yet? Yes, you guys, we started the study. We we're on Second Samuel uh, 17. Or uh, did we read all the other ones? Yeah. This is it? Yes. Okay, good. Yeah. We're on Second Samuel 17. Okay. So, Ru Rudy Barlon. All right. Uh, in 1623, we read that, quote, the advice of Athithop Ahithophel gave was like that of one who inquires of the Lord. However, in chapter 17, 1 through 14, after Ahithophel gave advice to Absalom, Absalom did not act right 
and did not act on it right away. Instead, he wanted to hear what Hushai the Archite had to say, which is what Absalom ended up following. It appears like Absalom's double-minded. However, in 1714, it says that the Lord determined to frustrate the good advice of Ahithophel to bring disaster on Absalom in answer to David's prayer in 1531. Yeah. The lesson I get here is that God does not always intervene directly in the affairs of men. Rather, he weaves his plans and purposes into the daily affairs of men, which reminds me of... Uh, uh, which book is that? Prov? Prov Proverbs, sorry. Proverbs 16.9, which says... A person may plan his path, but God directs his steps. Yes. Amen. Amen. Um, that's, that's a great comment. I agree with that, Rudy, and I think we both do. Absolutely. All right. Karen Dell Cunningham in Samuel, 2 Samuel 17.5. Was Absalom simply looking for a confirming word from Hushai? If he received a word from Ahithophel as equivalent to a word from God, and the plan pleased him, he still must have had doubts in that he sought further advice from Hushai. God was clearly in control, in control throughout all of this political intrigue and maneuvering, as he, a clear answer to David's prayers in 1531 shows up in 1714. Yep, same comment basically as, um, Ruby. as Rudy. Rudy, yeah. Sorry. Jennifer Connolly, 2 Samuel 7.14, and Absalom and all the men of Israel said, the counsel of Hushai the archite is better than the counsel of Ethapel. For the Lord had appointed to defeat the good counsel of Ahithophel to the intent that the Lord might bring evil upon Absalom. Question. Who are these people Absalom is inquiring of? I found it troubling that Absalom would think he was in God's will and brought about his disaster this way. His pride and ambition got the best of him. Well, yeah. I mean, he's definitely... Well, he was the <laughs> most beloved celebrity of his time. Yeah. So, he, yeah. His head grew bigger than his head of hair. <laughs> but um, oh, his head was so big it got stuck in the trees. Maybe that's why he had so much hair. Maybe it was actually, wow. you know, alluding Maybe. to the size of his noggin. <laughs> <laughs> it must have been massive, right? Yeah. Um, did you notice? I've always heard this that movie stars have big heads. They do actually. Literally big heads. You have a big head. I have a little head. That wouldn't be a very good movie star. No. Oh. There's a few that have little heads, but mostly they have big heads. Yeah. Anyway, biggest um, head I've ever seen was Quentin Tarantino. The guy has the biggest head of any person on planet Earth. <laughs> I swear. His head is so big that the first thing you notice about him is that his head is big. Yeah. I mean, it's huge. Huge heads. I don't even know how they make hats. He has to have hats made specially for him. Anyways. That's funny stuff. Um, so, uh, back to the question here. Yeah. Um, where were we? We're here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The question was... His pride ambition got the best yeah, of him. His pr uh, who, oh, who are these people Absalom is inquiring of? Well, Absalom had obviously a whole group of worshippers, you could say. A whole group of his uh, entourage. Well, it started with his 50 troops. So remember, this is how it all starts. He was banished. He comes back. But because he's not able to actually interact with his father, he has no power and no respect amongst the people because he's the banished son, which means that he'll, there's no chance of him ever being king at this moment. That's why he does the thing he does with... Uh, 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 ro ro wow. This is why you're supposed to get sleep before Bible ra ra What's his name? He was he was Mo David's no, Moab. No, uh, no, no. He Bor Mor ro 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 Roab? Roab. Yeah, Roab. There you go. That's it. Roab. Is it Roab? Yeah, because I said Moab. It's Roab. So okay, it's Roab. Roab. So his, his right hand military guy, right? The guy who's always there, and he's the one who was always constantly vouching for him. Anyways, he burns his field, right? And he says, you got to get my dad to let me see him. Why? Because he knew if he got his dad to see him, he would give him the blessing, he would kiss him, and he'd be prince again. That is when he takes his princehood, and he's able to use that to get 50 soldiers. And those 50 soldiers are his entourage. They follow him everywhere. He decides how much money they make. He decides how much they eat. He decides if they go on vacations or not. He treats them really well. And remember, too, he's the envy of every man, woman, and child in the land because he's so handsome and so charismatic. And then... And then he starts to he starts front to, and to give advice. He stands outside the, the palace walls, if you will, and he, he goes, oh, are you going to see my dad for him to like help you with a problem? Oh, just come to me. He's, he doesn't even have time for you, but I do because I love you. Mm -hmm. And then he kisses every single person who brings him a problem. So he rewards them for having an issue. And, and so this is how he builds his entourage. He basically is really like the first sign we see of a politician in the Bible. 
He's like a modern day politician. He's going around the going around kissing babies. Joab, thank you very much. I don't know how to say your name, buddy. Or, well, oh, I'm Chukwu. sorry. No, buddy. Yeah. Oh, the you have a great name. Joab, I don't know how to thank say. you. Yes. Thank That's you, Joab. It. Roab. What's wrong with that? Well, I don't know. Every day. Well. So, yeah. So uh, long, that's that's a mystery that we should not go into. Yes. So that is uh that is uh, the thing. He he built it up. He it was a it was a strategic thing, and he built up his fan base, and he did quite well with it. Okay. He'd have the most Instagram followers if he was alive today. Yeah. I mean, for sure. For sure. Um, Jill Cutler Higgins. Hey guys. Oh, sorry. Uh, can you explain why Ahithapel committed suicide? I understand that he realized his counsel wasn't sought out, but this is that is pretty dramatic to just do yourself in. Seventeen Samuel seventeen. Um, yeah, I have some ideas. I mean, Ahithapel was counseled to King David. He switched sides, betrayed King David, and thought that thought that uh, uh, Absalom would become the most powerful king now, the king, and he's going to be this king's number one guy. Right. And when this king rejected him, he had nowhere else to turn. He didn't feel special anymore. Yeah. And he also felt like the Lord wasn't talking to him anymore. And that's all he was. He was the guy who gave counsel. He gave counsel. And and he felt like the Lord abandoned him for probably picking the wrong guy to follow, mm -hmm. which he did. He picked the wrong guy to follow. So so it's it's a shame. And maybe it also is a sign, too, that he had an ego problem. Maybe, you know, sometimes people who have spiritual gifts think that they're extra important because the Lord has chosen them for a spiritual gift to flow out of them and the person actually takes credit or feels that that validates the value of their soul over somebody else's soul. And so that's not the case. Hmm. And, uh, and so I think at this time, why would he commit suicide? Because he messed up one time. Why didn't he repent, return to David and, and allow David to choose his fate since David was his real king on earth? Um, or, or even just repent to God and, and try to cleanse himself of that. I think that the suicide shows that his his perfect relationship and his perfect counsel over the years got to his head. You know, that was why he existed. Yeah, that was. And when that was rejected, yeah, he felt not necessary to exist anymore. Yeah, it's very sad. Second, in that Samuel, way, he's a lot like Judas. Uh, yes, at least a lot in, like the, Judas. in his face. Except Judas was kind of betraying him the whole time, though. Yeshua says. Yeah, right. He was like the purse guy, and he finagled the money right yeah uh, just just in his in his end he's yeah. a lot like judas yeah and judas betrays yeshua ahithophel betrayed mm. david i think it also plays in <clears throat> let's bring the yeshua in thing real just really quick on this i think it brings in also another point to yeshua yeshua was the most anointed obviously total anointing he was total power he was total authority and he submitted himself to be the servants to the others he was the one who cleaned their feet he was the one who allowed them to eat when there was only so much food. Like, he, he was the ultimate, not only in gifting and power and authority, but also in humility. And, uh, and I, I just think that, that this is actually a really good thing to see, that there are many people who have a lot of gifts in the body of Christ. And because of those gifts and because of their anointing or their, their role and their, their position in the body of Christ, they actually think they're like overly important or or that 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 means that they're so much important that they if they should mess up they should kill themselves kind of thing it's very sad anyways but i want to just tie into yeshua his his humility is also a guide for us amen that's all second samuel 18 Rudy Barlan in 184, Joab was one of the army leaders commanded by david to be gentle with a young man absalom for my sake but in 1814 Joab plunged three javelins and plunged them into Absalom's heart while Absalom was still alive in the oak tree. Joab blatantly disobeyed David, probably due to his loyalty to his duty, which is to make sure that David remains king. But David was overcome by father's love and compassion, which to me reflects God's heart. Sometimes, like Joab, we Christians hold so tightly to our Christian morality at the expense of love and compassion toward God's children. That was so Superman drop right there? Yeah, that was mic drop, mic drop. Just saying. Times 55. Yeah. Well, well said, Rudy. Well said. Susan Harris, Yeshua's focus was on the Father as ours should be, not on anything else. Okay, Susan, just fine. 
Just get a mic we, drop. We need, we need Just a get new, a mic drop, we Susan. Need a, we need a new mic drop. I'll graphic. get more. Like I've machine been busy. gun mic, mic drops. Oh, machine gun mic drops? Yeah, like... Like where they just fall out of the sky? Yeah, or like a machine gun is... Or a bomber bombing. Like, oh, you mean like... That was like, an explosion No, of like they, they just keep coming. Like many, many mic drops. Oh, I could do that. Watch. Because like we just had multiple mic drops in a row and I want a special graphic for it. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll create something like that. I'm requesting this from the producer of the show. Yes. All right. <laughs> like I'll, I'll add it to my list of things to do. Don't worry. I got it, guys. <laughs> okay. Uh, Rudy Barlon in 18.5. David gave orders to Joab, Abishai, and Itai. He said, for my sake, deal, deal gently with Absalom. But in 18.14... Is, oh, okay. Same thing. Job took three javelins, plunged in Absalom's heart, and Absalom was still out in the oak tree, and, and with ten of his armor bearers surrounded Absalom, struck him, and killed him. Then in 1833, David wept for Absalom, saying, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died instead of you, oh, Absalom, my son, my son. David would rather die for his rebellious son, who wanted to kill him. This shows that the father's love for his son far exceeds the love of the son for his father. Mm -hmm. John 3.16 reminds me of God's great love towards rebellious people like me, and he died to save us from eternal death and be with him forever and ever. Can we get another mic drop in here? I knew the machine Fine, gun Grant. mic drop Let's ideas. Just, well, we, got, we got him on here too. <sighs> you guys are dropping bombs on us right now. Okay, yeah. Rudy Barlon in 18.8, it says, that the forest claimed more lives that day than the sword. This really puzzles me. I cannot think of how God used the forest to kill people. God killed his enemies with water, with fire, and with his angels. Mm -hmm. I know that Absalom got his hair caught in the oak tree. Did the other trees in the forest also catch the other soldiers? Maybe. It could be that the soldiers got lost in the forest and died of hunger. This seems plausible since they did not have any compass then. Regardless, this tells me that God has his entire creation at his disposal to accomplish his purposes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Could he have been using, could, I mean, could the trees have gotten up and walked? He's God. If you have, Yeshua made a tree walk. If you have the faith of a mustard seed, well, so maybe. maybe that's what it was referring to. Maybe the trees attacked him like, you know, trance and like yeah, Lord exactly. of the Rings. Maybe that, maybe that whole legend about trance came from this From moment. this, trees killing the peoples. Listen, with God, I ain't putting it past him. Right. I, I, it doesn't say, but I wouldn't put it past him. But yeah, it could be too the other thing. It could be the animals. could be they were attacked by, you know, livestock or like wolves or something. It could be anything, but it could be also the trees attacked. Listen, if a donkey can talk and a staff can turn into a snake, I can't even imagine what a tree would do. Hmm. I mean, it's also showing that... And Candy Can Do points out, but it says that they died that day, didn't it? So they couldn't have died of starvation. I think I think the trees did attack. I'm going to be honest. My conviction is I think somehow the Lord used the trees I, I, I'm feeling to attack that, them. I'm feeling that right now, too, yeah. just because it literally just came up. We started thinking about tree ants and all that stuff. And unless he had a pompadour, if you guys know what a pompadour is, like where your hair like goes up, like how did Absalom's hair get caught into a tree? Or like he's riding a horse and like his head doesn't get taken off, but his hair gets caught in the tree. Yeah. Like is his hair like if it's so heavy, it's not going to be and, flying up. And it wasn't going to be way down. It wasn't like David's men were a large number. It was all of Israel, basically an entire That's army true. of Israel. He's against, back in the forest again. Against David's men, which were like maybe 600 guys. Again, yeah. With some help. So technically this war should have never been won by David's men. But because the forest claimed the lives of many... It was. Yeah, I think the I think the trees literally attacked people. That's what I'm gonna say. I'm actually with you on that, 100. percent I'm do. with you on that. But you know what? Woo! Our faith to a non-believer is foolishness. Oh! Do I get a mic drop? Now? You do get a mic drop. Okay, Rich Ricardo says maybe I got late. Did you answer this? Is it counting Israel by David order wrong because it implies that? Oh, because it implies that he is counting David's people and not Yahweh's people, we will answer that in yeah. just a bit. You, you, yeah, it's, we it's, haven't gotten there yet. We no. haven't gotten there yet. That's in the. That's towards the end. Um. <laughs> Jennifer Carly, what a strange way to get your big head stuck in a tree and hang there. <laughs> also, how much would that hurt? You're hanging by your hair on your head. If his hair was as thick as it's, they say it was, it probably would have been possible. Well, yeah, for sure. I think it's also funny that the ha, vice versa says he got ahead of himself. Uh, but um, <laughs> should be here all night. He'll, 
<laughs> He'll be here all night. Sorry, vice versa. He got ahead of himself. Yes, very well done. Um, oh, my gosh. This <laughs> is hilarious. All right. Uchua. Maybe it was very windy that day. Very true. <laughs> Could have been very windy that day. Could have been, absolutely. Or at least within the forest, absolutely. All right, Fanus. Yeah, I mean, what, I'm just thinking about if the trees really did attack, it makes sense that it wouldn't be given glory to. Mm -hmm. Because it would be, it would, it would, maybe it would be a stumbling block for believers that did not need to be there at this point. Well, yeah, I mean, and also the angel comes and gives a plague and David actually goes and talks with the angel. Yeah, he sees like, the we angel. Have, we have no idea how supernatural the world was at this time, you guys. Right. We really don't. You know, I think the world has gotten less supernatural until Yeshua comes and then the Holy Spirit comes and the supernatural came back. Like it, it seems that there was not really a whole lot of supernatural happening between the prophets and Yeshua, you know, yeah. except for what happened with uh, Hanukkah. But other than that, there was like not really a whole lot of supernatural. But even that happened. wasn't like a big, huge, like it wasn't trees or, you know, angels walking around, around plaguing people. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Faunus Prinzu, 2 Samuel 18, 9. And Absalom met the servants of David, and Absalom rode upon a mule, and the mule went under the thick boughs of a great oak, and his head got caught, mm. uh, his head caught hold of the oak, and was taken up between the heaven and the earth. And the mule that was under him went away. This reminded me of a saying in Afrikaans translated, Beauty disappear, but virtue remains. It was Absalom's beautiful hair that caused his death. How many of our young people look up to Hollywood stars because of their beauty and glamour, but don't see the virtue or are misled by the lack of virtue, by their it's lack of virtue? unbelievable. It's unbelievable how much. Yeah. Yeah. Kim Canardi, as a horseback rider, some horses will purposely run you under a low branches. <laughs> That's funny. And Brian Menning says, other thoughts was poison berries. So the food that they were eating in the wilderness that they ate that day could have been poisonous berries or food could've. that they could have been eating. That's another one. That's a good one. You're talking about Lord of the Rings? Mm -hmm. Oh, you're asking Brian. Sorry. Uh, okay. Yeah, it could have been poison food. That makes sense, too. <laughs> Brian's <laughs> injecting sanity into our ideas. Yeah, I know. Um, uh, they could have ate something bad, guys. Yeah. <laughs> Trees didn't have to kill them. <laughs> Brian, I want to believe a tree beat them up. <laughs> okay, Linda L. Okay. Eli. Uh, where are we? Second Samuel 18, 9 through 15. Yes. Interesting how earlier it mentioned how heavy Absalom's hair was, and we see here that his head got caught in a tree. <laughs> I know. <laughs> could be that his hair got could be that his hair got caught. In verse 8, it mentions that the forest devoured more people that day than the sword. Any thoughts on what that means? Made me think of the Lord of the Rings, Rings. when the trees were fighting against the people. Yeah. Linda, you're way ahead of us. I'm, there you go. I'm I'm super there with you. I gotta be honest. I think the trees attacked people. I'm still convinced. I don't even think berries would do it. I mean, why would Yeshua say you can make the tree pick up and walk if it wasn't the case? Right? Yeah. Karen, though, has a good point. Karen Cunningham. Could it be just a poetic way of describing the extreme rough terrain of the forest that just pursuing after an enemy was deadly? Well, the thing cliffs, is, though, is cliffs like, would be that way. Well, it could, I don't know. Maybe I don't really go wandering in forests. So maybe they fell off cliffs. Maybe they, tr I don't know. To me, though, the thing is, is that people that lived back then were pretty hardy people. It wasn't like they were city slickers. Even back then, even if you lived in a town, you weren't really usually a city slicker unless you were royalty. And like you never had to go and pick a single berry. You never had to kill an animal to eat it. Like most people back then were hardy people and they would know how to navigate a forest and especially soldiers. So I don't know. That's why I think the, the trees actually attacked is I just don't see these people being so out of control on how to interact with a forest that it that they would like everybody trips and dies or gets lost or eats bit poison berries i mean there are berries that look very similar and you'd have to know I, but i mean it could also mean that very few people died by the sword only absalom and maybe a couple others and that it's trying to say that more people died in the wilderness or in the forest by accidents or poison or whatever right than than the actual warfare took so now that I think back to that passage, I took it as uh, like the, the Israelites, yeah, like the Israelites and, and David's people didn't go on killing each other like crazy. That God basically brought an end to the conflict by serving up Absalom as quickly as possible to David's men. And once Absalom was killed, the Israelites just said, "Oh, okay, well, no reason to keep fighting now." So, 
Uh -huh. Sorry. So anyway, but we like the Triets idea for sure. <laughs> um, uh, Stephen King, eat your heart out. Yeah. yeah. We will follow David. And then the trees start moving and grabbing you. <laughs> Hilarious. <laughs> All right. Where are we? Jennifer Connelly. Um, Jennifer Connelly, 2 Samuel 18, 29, 31. Okay. And the king said, Is the young man Absalom safe? And Ahimaaz answered, When Joab set the king's servant, and me thy servant, I saw great tumult, but I knew not what it was. And the king said unto him, Turn aside and stand here. And he turned aside and stood still. And behold, Cushi came, and Cushi said, Tidings, my lord the king, for the lord has avenged thee this day of all of them that rose up against thee. Question, why Joab's son Ahimaaz run out before the Cushimite runner, knowing his father killed David's son, after he beat out the other guy in the race, why did he say there was a great tumult and not tell him the news? Uh, maybe Ahimaaz now, maybe Ahimaaz um, was, well, he's, Ahim, if Ahimaaz was Joab's son, if you're right about that, which I think you are, he might have been afraid for Joab. So he wanted to like lessen the blow and he didn't have the courage to tell the king that Absalom is dead. Um, also, he might have wanted to be a representative to be there on his behalf before he heard the news. So that way it did, like, you know, if somebody shows up and there's like no representative for the person, you're just like, wrath. You remember like exactly like what David did when he was told the story about the rich man who killed the lamb, right? And he's like, this is bad. We will wrath this man. And maybe he thought by showing up, standing there with David, when he heard the bad news, he would kind of be like, well, this, I do, I remember you now, like you're here in the moment. I love you. I love your dad. Let's, let's deal with this. I'm thinking that's why it was. What? Why he ran out to beat the Cushamite and be there? Yeah, and just kind of like tell. dampen the blow so that dampen it was a representative, blow. you know, to like, hey, remember yeah. we're friends or though. It could, we're friends. We're friends. Don't it, kill us. Right. It, it, it could also be that he just was sent forward to not tell David the whole truth. To but the Cushamite got there and told him. Yeah, but he like didn't not he didn't kill the other guy on the way. No. If you didn't want the news to be delivered, you would have like killed that guy on the way. You know. Right. That's a good question, though. Honestly, I don't know. And I don't think there's something that explains what his motives were or whatever. Oh, look at this. Jennifer Connelly. Jennifer. Okay, you get Brian Kranz. Whenever there's a report. Did I give you a full one? I'm sorry. Hold on. There you go. Whenever there's a report. Two witnesses. Two witnesses. And Kim Kennardy just says, or how he killed the guy who claimed to, kill, to have killed Saul. Right. Right? Just that whole moment of like, Bring David the wrong kind of news, and you might just not. That's not going to go well. It's not. You're not. Yeah. Even if you think you did a good thing, if you did the good thing in a bad way, David's like off with the head. Maybe Ahimaaz was there to just kind of muddle the waters and not to be so blatant, not for it to come out so blatant that Joab plunged the three spears into Absalom, and then they all killed him. You know. Maybe Ahimaaz was there to just make a confusion about it yeah i love this patty neff where do you think the wizard of oz treat sorry i had to burp that was really embarrassing where do you think the <laughs> wizard of oz trees came from the trees they threw apples hmm so many bible references in the movie and yeah. if i only had a brain <sighs> wait that was just for me sorry okay <laughs> well that's my theme song it okay. is my theme song um where are we uh, we're at Second Samuel 19, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. Bonus Prince Luke. Yeah. And the victory that day was turned into mourning unto all the people, for the people heard say that day how the king was grieved for his son. As per Luke 19.41, I believe Yeshua's grief, every, Yesh, I believe Yeshua grieves every soul that is lost, yet, uh, that is lost. All Yeshua asks is to accept him in your life, Believe he's your savior. Believe Jehovah is Yeshua in flesh. And Yeshua died on the cross for your sins. And after three days, raised from the dead. Is that so hard to believe? Seems like it. I refused it for 24 years of my life. I agree with you, Fanish. I think he, I think he mourns every single person as well. He says he wishes for all to come on to him. So, I agree. Mm. Rudy Barlon, 19.2. Instead of celebration and rejoicing at the victory of David's army over his enemies, it was turned into mourning because David was grieved for his son Absalom. This offended Joab. To him, 
What David was doing is tantamount to humiliating his men who saved his life. Joab boldly rebukes the king and expressed his accusations against the king. Quote, you love those who hate you and you hate those who love you. It does appear that way. Mm -hmm. Job felt that David did not care of, of did not care if all his men were dead as long as Absalom, who wanted to kill him, was alive. Then Job gave David the ultimatum in verse 19:7, and King David gave in. In this incident, the Lord showed me that men are incapable of showing love and justice simultaneously. Joab meted out justice to Absalom, but without love. David showed love for Absalom, but ignores justice for Absalom's rebellion. Only God is able to show love at the same time, meet out justice. Mm -hmm. He did this for us at the cross through our Lord Yeshua. He gave Yeshua to us because he loves us so much. And he let Yeshua die on the cross for us to pay for our sins. Hello. Wow, Rudy. Which one? Rudy. This one? Uh, we need to send you a gilded microphone, man. I'm just going to give it. Gonna that do is this. awesome. Uh, this is a true statement that you say. It's, yeah. So it's wrong. Mm -hmm. And there is a passage that's coming. Where is it? Psalms? Is this the first time that's word? Uh, nothing is more deceitful than men's heart. What? What? Who can? Who can see a man's heart? Who can reason it? It's too, it's too deceitful. So that's another thing, too, is like, yeah, David's crying over the very guy who raised the entire nation up against him to kill him. And then the guys who killed him, they're worried that they'll be killed because they, they, they saved the nation and they saved his kingdomship. That's Humans everywhere, even in the old days. Okay. Yeah. Very good comment. Jennifer, Jennifer Connolly. Jennifer Connolly, 2 Samuel 19.6. In that thou lovest thine enemies and hatest thy friends, for thou hast declared this day that thou regardest neither prince nor servants. For this day I perceive that if Absalom had lived and all we had died this day, then it would have pleased thee well. Question. King David did in fact love his enemies and try to bless them, which is why he was a man after God's own heart. But I wonder why he always had to deal with this problem. Mm -hmm. Possibly because of his position... People were always chasing him, but he loved all his pursuers so deeply that they never returned the love, and they never returned the love. How many who have family or people close to them that have treated them wrongly can say the same? What was up with Joab trying to get someone else to kill Absalom when doing the deed himself, then doing the deed himself, then trying to advise David to show face with the people? Was he trying to help? Was this God's will? Did he have motives? Well, did he have motives? Again, we can't necessarily know a man's heart. I, I personally perceive that at this moment in the story, Joab is, is able to kind of step back and see the greater good and see what needs to be done. You know, there's certain military generals who like, this needs to be done and it's a hard choice to make and they're good at making it. You know what I mean? You mean as far as him killing Absalom yeah. or as far as him rebuking David? No, no, well, both. Yeah, I think that he rebukes David is a, is a good rebuke. You know, he's not saying don't mourn your son, but man, you're just throwing the rest of us under the bus. Even though there was no buses back then, I guess it would have been the horse carriage. But you get what I'm saying? Under the chariot. Yeah. You're under just, the seven-wheel chariot. You're just throwing us under the seven-wheel chariot, David. You don't even care. <laughs> so, And also, that's not good for morale. And it also doesn't help that the nation was already against David. He wasn't showing that he cared about them when that you know the leader has to step forward. He has to be the one to do, to do right when they're hating him. He has to make them love them. Him, you get what I mean? Yeah. And uh, and Joab understood this. He, I think Joab had. I think Joab was a was at this point in the story. He was a clear-minded guy who could assess situations. You get what I mean? I think that obviously he makes mistakes, uh, but maybe that's also why. The mistake I see he made was that he pushed for Absalom to get back in relationship with David. But he did that because Absalom burnt his field. <laughs> yeah. You, you know what I mean? But And obviously when he called for him, he ignore, ignored him, probably knowing what he wanted. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So. I mean, Joab proves himself to be a loyal captain, and he also proves himself to be very vengeful. And this is not after David's heart. Um, but It's not after David's heart, but is it after Israel's heart? Is it after God's heart? That's the question that's well, been asked. I mean, I think what Rudy said in the prior thing, in the prior comment, uh, really speaks well. I mean, Joab does what a military leader is called to do. Is called to do. He's defending the King David at all costs, 
And even when King David himself seems to be, in, in Job's mind, if King David is oblivious to a threat mm -hmm. and Joab feels there is a threat, then it is on Joab to act on the threat regardless of how David may feel about it. Mm -hmm. That's what Joab takes as his uh, burden to bear. Burden to bear. <coughs> and from certain points of view, it seems quite noble. Yeah. But... Um, At the same time, if it was your kid he killed, yeah. <laughs> you'd probably be time, like, great yeah. man. You're not, you're not my friend. Joab is not allowing King David to be King David. Joab wants, Joab limits David's kindness. He puts limits on David's kindness. And he believes he's doing it for the greater good. But we find out later what happens to Joab because of all of this. Really? What? I just wanted to let people know that just there's please. more about this whole Joab saga than, than, than we've read so far. Um, I'm messing. Um, what was I getting? Well, there's another question in there somewhere, right? Well, read it again if you need to. Um, uh, was this God's will? Did he have motives? He meaning Joab? Yeah. Okay, we just was talked about we believe. Oh, yeah. Was it God's will? I think it was. He doesn't seem to get smited for it. So if God doesn't smite him, I think it's God's will. You mean Joab? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And also the fact that it was prophesied to happen. Remember, David was told that his yeah, sons I mean, would have this happening. Yeah. Somebody did leave that comment, though. I think it was Jennifer This Conley. is This whole sad drama with Absalom is a continuance of the curse or the continuance of David's <laughs> having to pay for the sin of having Uriah killed for Bathsheba. So uh, that's our understanding of why this is occurring. Yes. Um, okay. Faunus Prince Lou, 2 Samuel 19. And what? Ricardo says, no spoilers, please. A lot of people agree with him. <laughs> so just for the record. Uh, you know what? I'm just going to sew my lips shut. Yeah. Now read we'll what? just read it like this. Or or read read the king of Rose. <laughs> <laughs> Prince, we did that joke at the same time. Yeah. Like, really? Okay. Faunus <laughs> Prince Lou, 2 Samuel 19.8. Then the king arose and sat in the gate, and they told unto all the people, saying, Behold, the king doth sit in the gate. And all the people came before the king, for Israel had fled every man to his tent. The city gate plays an important role in the Bible. It was the center of the community action, the place where elders gathered and decisions were made. Remember Boaz settled legal matters for his marriage to Ruth, mm -hmm. Eli waiting at the city gate on word of the ark and his sons. The Golden Gate in Jerusalem is also called the Gate of Mercy. It is currently closed, built up, yep. maybe for the future as per Ezekiel 44, 1 through 3. Mm -hmm. Talk about spoiler alert. Okay, very cool. Yes. Very cool, Fanis. Totally agree. Um, it is going to be interesting to see what happens regarding that. Mm -hmm. Karen Del Cunningham, in chapters 18 and 19, we can certainly see the consequences to David's very human and understandable sympathy and emotional bond to his son Absalom. However, his deep conflicted emotions for his son affected and influenced his decisions as king and caused insecurity and chaos in the kingdom. David is seen several times to seemingly try to control the outcome for Absalom, just as we can try to control outcomes for our family members. Our human emotions and soul ties can get in the way of trusting God implicitly. Although David is one of the great figures in the Bible and had a heart after God, he also seems to typify many believers today who are controlled and influenced by human emotions rather than the provision of the Holy Spirit. All right, I'm going to let you pick which one. Me? I yeah. get to pick which? I don't know. Which Just one? find the biggest, baddest, most awesome. How about the kingly drop. one? She gets the kingly man, mean one. Yeah. Minion. Totally. That was a good one, Karen. That was a good one. And I agree with you 100%. That's one of the things. I, I did notice that as well, and I, it, it spoke to me as well about how there's... Just how the body of Christ can be. I mean, how, how we as believers, humans, you know, that's the thing. We're humans, guys. I think it's... You are? We are? No, not really. We're new creations. But... Very good. Don't point out my obviousness, okay? So, <laughs> what I'm saying is, we are these limited beings stuck in a world of limitations, dealing with an unlimited power living in us. Wow. And it's such a crazy dichotomy you're getting deep on me bro that when we try to take what is the holy ghost power and the holy ghost understanding and we take a look at our very limited very broken world i don't know if it's ever happened to you but the level of frustration that comes through every pore of your body can be quite unbearable and that's both a blessing and sometimes it's 
the cross to bear? Oh, are you, are you trying to get mic drops right now? No, I'm just trying to get you to wake up and pay attention. Uh, so we'll, it's we'll our cross again. to bear is that is that we have to be the bearers of the Holy Spirit in a way that the world has never been prior to the cross, prior to Pentecost. And I think it is fascinating that we are David, we are Joab, we are the first to pick up the stone and throw it. Uh, we 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 are all these people. I mean, as I'm reading through the Bible, I'm relating to all of them. Uh, I would like to relate more to the heroes, but a lot of times I relate more to the to the ones who stumble and fall. And and it's when you have the Holy Ghost and you're trying to to interact with this broken world, it becomes close to the feeling of impossible. You know what I mean? Do you feel that way, or is it just me? Yeah, no, I do feel that way. And so I think I think it is interesting <clears throat> to see that when you read the Bible too, it's almost like God saying. It's almost like God is saying that he told these stories. He allowed these stories to unfold as they did. He allowed the human will to be done. And then he would come in and either clean it up or bring in somebody to clean it up. And and all I'm trying to say, I guess, is the point I'm trying to get to is saying the body of Christ today is all the broken people of the past and that we shouldn't be throwing stones at any of them. We shouldn't be throwing stones at any of ourselves. And that anything that does come good from us and that any of us who stay on course through this crazy world, it's only because the Holy Spirit's moving our feet, feet to stay on that course. And, and I think that, that that realization might be a thing that's, that might be a little, little less uh, held onto in our modern world because we have so many blessings, because we have so many comforts. That's it. Mm. Just a point I wanted to point out. Okay. I, I feel you. I um, wasn't a spoiler. Oh, that's an old message. Old message. So, Karen, just real quick. I mean, this is one of the one of the reasons why the Lord says He's no respecter of men, because you're, because men will find themselves conflicted with their w w with what they feel about their loved ones and with what they feel about their enemies and with what they feel about their friends and all of these feelings are going to get in the way of perfect justice of what is right, and uh, but at the same time. Though he's no respecter of men in that way to serve those things mm -hmm. uh, ahead of his purpose or ahead of his justice, of the, of the righteous justice, he's not going to serve those things, but he does regard those things. David is a man after his own heart. David is not able to deal out justice in the way that God is. Right. David is not able to weave and... Co co he can't these, see the total picture He like can't God, see can. the total picture. He's not meant to see the total picture. Mm -hmm. But his, his love... For his enemies show that David understands that they're only enemies because of circumstance. Yeah. That if circumstance been different, they could be best friends. And or at least he has that hope. He has that hope. At and, least. And, at and least. When we don't know. But yeah. When he sees that, and when he has that hope and he sees that in others, he wants to try and make that happen over destroying them mm -hmm. so that they never bother him again. Of course, when David looks across the aisle or across the the field of battle and see someone that absolutely the best friend thing could never happen they will always be enemies then david wants to thrash him yep man after god's own man after god's heart um uh rudy barlan in 1921 through 23 david again reflected god's own heart when he forgave shimei who cursed him and pelted him and his men with stones another case of loving your enemy yeah also, Rudy, I think in that moment, David is like, no, no, you let him keep, talk keep talking because I understand this is... David understood that this was all happening as punishment. From This was God's will. David was going through a reproach, a punishment, a curse that God put upon him. And David knew, felt or knew, that Shimei wasn't doing this just of his own accord. He was doing this because he was moved by God to do this. This was part of the punishment that David had to live through. And that's um, an amazing amount of wisdom. Yeah. To be able to see somebody's actions, not as their actions even, but as literally the will of God coming through them, coming at you. Like how many believers, how many believers out there are sitting there watching their boss be a jerk to them or their family members abandon them and they think to themselves, okay, I deserve this. The Lord is just reprimanding me. God's timing, it will all be fixed if it's God's timing. And they're just, they're just, they receive it like that. 
How many times do we want to do? That's unbelievable. How many times do we want to do battle against the flesh? You come against me, I come against you. And that's what I mean. What is? How are we? This is this is the exact. David is actually showing the wisdom of you battle not against flesh and blood. Well, he knows exactly. He understands exactly that whatever comes against him is because the Lord put it against him. He understands that whatever is a blessing to him is because the Lord blessed him. Yeah. That's yeah, he's so clear. That's why that. when David looks at Goliath, he doesn't see a giant with a giant sword. No, he sees, he sees a reproach against Israel. And he's like, that ain't going to stand. Yep. I'll have your head, bud. Man. And he's a good trash talker, too, which is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Second Samuel 20. David rocks. Okay, uh, Jennifer Connolly. Uh, sorry, Alex, for the long read. Oh, please. I it's love not that to, long. I love to hear myself talk anyway. That's why I gave him the read job. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't that the truth? Okay. Uh, First Chronicles 20, 4 through 8. We're looking ahead here. Chronicles. Wow. And it came to pass after this that there arose war at Gezer with the Philistines. Wait, wait, wait. It, it, it must not be Chronicles, because I figured it was Samuel, because I saw 20. Okay, keep going. Uh, and, or maybe there's a question about Chronicles. Okay. okay. Um, and it came to pass after this that there arose war at Gezer with the Philistines, at oh. which time... Yeah, this is this is Samuel, sorry. S okay, Sibachai the Hushite slew Sipai, that was of the children of the giant, and they were subdued. And there was war again with the Philistines, and... Eth Elhanan, the son of Jair, slew Lachmi, the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, whose spear staff was like a weaver's beam. And yet again there was war at Gath, and there was a man of great stature, whose fingers and toes were four and twenty, six on each hand and six on each foot, and he also was the son of a giant. But when he defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimea, David's brother, slew him. There were born unto the giants in these were born unto the giants in Gath, and they fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. Interesting that Jehovah had David take out all of the giants' bloodline. He did. Did he also totally take out most of most? Did sorry. Did he also totally take out most, if, if not, not all, of Saul's? I know he left Jonathan's son. Yes, and yes. Yeah. Actually, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Saul's bloodline does get completely, pretty much... Which is prophesied. Yeah, it gets completely wiped off. Yes. Sir. Well, you know, coming back to our talk about genetics, and that fact that your genetics change throughout your life, mm -hmm. is it possible that Saul's genetics got to a point, after all the curses and all the sins and all the bad things that he might have done, Saul's genetics got to a point that no good fruit could be born from them? One of the other reasons why his bloodline was cursed to be destroyed. Well, I don't think his genetics affected his living family's genetics. I'm saying the ones of those are his descendants. She's referring to. I have no comment. Maybe just hey, just to tie back to what we were saying earlier. Okay, Doreen Nor uh, Doreen Anderson, um, Samuel twenty sixteen through twenty two. I wonder who the wise woman was that orchestrated the beheading of Sheba, Sheba. And why didn't one of the men of Abel Beth Makkah actually make the deal with Joab? Just seems to me that it would have been a manly thing to do. Well, the woman sh is actually, when you talk about this, when we yeah. read it, she comes to the gate and she speaks to stop them. It, just a little thing about men. If a woman comes, we're going to be a little bit more open to listening to her, especially if we're already in like a heated kill everything mode. So the fact that a woman comes and says, hey, why are you attacking me? I'm, and she knows how she starts off with like a... Uh, I'm the mother of I'm, Israel. I'm the, I'm the mother of... I'm one of the mothers of Israel. I'm, I'm a, I think she was a widow. Or she had certain... She named as many kids as she had. Yeah. You know, why would you come and kill me just because I'm in this building and this is an anointed land? You know it's anointed. Why are you coming to kill this town? He's like, God forbid I should kill this town. What are you talking about? But he probably was there to kill the town if he had to, to get the enemy he was going after. So the reason why I think that it was a woman that came out is just because a man will at least give a pause and listen to the woman. Where like if one of the guys he was hunting down or some man who was like a gatekeeper was just like, stop. He's like, don't tell me what to do. I'm coming. Just because you told me stop. No, I'm not going to stop. Like, it's just how we are. You women are our, are, our, are our blessing to cool the heated blood in our war veins. Amen. Absolutely. So, I mean, <laughs> and, and she's wise. She's like, okay, chop off his head, 
and throw that bad boy over the wall. And of course, why chop off the head and throw it over the wall is because it was proof of his death. There'd be right. no other way of proving cutting off his hand. You don't know whose hand it is. So the only way to prove uh, without like y you know them coming in uh, is to send the head over. So I think the woman was very wise, and I think it had to be a woman to do this. I don't think a man could have pulled it off. I agree. It makes a lot of sense. It'd be like you're after your you know you're you're at the playground and and your buddy just hurt you or hit you and you're running after him to to pay him back and then his mother steps in the way mm -hmm. or his sister now if it was his like brother that stepped in the way you might fight the brother yeah of course but if it's sister steps in the way you kind of stop and you you're not gonna you're gonna get the sister um in most cases kim guy, kim and know, vice but. versa you guys are making me blush thanks <laughs> <laughs> all right moving on um second samuel 21 faunus prince lou uh, you know, just just real quick about that comment. Can you imagine if instead of men, young men, you know, we're talking about 18 to 22 in, in all of those world wars, okay. the majority privates are young men. Uh, before, if, before they stepped out onto the field to shoot each other, what if their mothers showed up? Both sides. Right. Grabbed him by the ear. Get off this yeah, battlefield. Yeah. What Put are you that down. doing? What are you, are you crazy? Put that gun down. Let's go. That would have been the end of the fight. I mean, there's some... <laughs> <laughs> it's as funny as it sounds, Mothers right? could have totally ended the war. Mothers could end all wars. As <laughs> if, funny as if, it sounds. If every mother of every man was on the battlefield, if another man's wa mother came out, probably not. Yeah, probably but, not. But if your own mother came out, yeah, that's that's pretty funny, actually. Yeah. All right, Second Samuel 21, Phanus. Phanus Prinsloo. Um, uh, then there was a famine in the days of David, three years, year after year, and David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered, it is for Saul and for his bloody house because he slew the Gibeonites. South Africa is currently going through a really bad five-year drought. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that it is not God's punishment because of Yeshua, but as a nation, we're not at all, we're not all God-fearing Christian nation. Sometimes it is difficult not to think it is God's punishment on us, or is it God's way to let us know we're doing wrong? Mm -hmm. Yehovah you have a punishment on a nation. Does this still hold true? Genesis 12, 3. I will bless those who bless you, mm -hmm. Israel, and I will curse those who curses you. How do we distinguish between you have a blessing or punishment on a nation versus an individual? Reading on 2 Samuel 22 is the answer to the above. Oh, okay. We'll get to 2 Samuel 22 in, as we go. So, mm -hmm. Safanus, you're saying there is an answer to your question in the scriptures itself. So, we're probably going to avoid talking about it. But, um, Well, when it's an attack on the individual, the individual will be attacked. When it's an attack on the nation, there will be multiple people who are affected by the outcome. Yeah. But, but in, in layman's, obviously, I'm, I'm saying, but I do look forward I mean, to 22 and seeing what it says. The question about those who bless you, Israel, and I will curse those who curse you, is that still, does that still hold? The answer is absolutely it still absolutely holds. Absolutely holds. In fact, it's talking almost more about in times when that passage actually shows up. Yeah. It does, it does apply here. And it, uh, it, it does here. apply throughout the Bible. Right. I mean, that we see it applying, but it also is reapplied at in times as well. Yeah. So. Because the because Israel is abandoned except for basically by one country, which we won't say who they are. Oh, Satan, Sorry, go ahead. What? Hmm? Oh, I got a little patriotic there. Yeah. Second Samuel twenty-two. Um, Just no, no, no. They Dorian, have other fans. Dorian supporters. Anderson, uh, chapter twenty-one. What is going on with David after Reese Pa in 1014 laid out sackcloth and protected the bodies of the Gibeonites killed? David went to get the bones of Saul and Jonathan. Was David regretting letting the Gibeonites kill the seven male descendants of Saul? I don't think he was, well, regretting as in like, I'm happy that it had to happen, maybe. But, uh, it, you know, those were sacrifices in order to bring justice back into what the Israelites had promised the Gibeonites. And it was what lifted the drought or the um, the famine and um, it seems like David is honoring Jonathan and Saul to this day to that day and, and kind of putting up all the all the dead bones kind of together in a, in a marked place yeah so David, they also they also didn't believe that a person could rest until the bones were in the place where it was supposed to be and handled in the way it was supposed to be handled so yeah and, and Dave, David this Which is might be true this by is the way. to show again that David didn't choose 
to have Saul's descendants killed because he hated Saul or he hated Jonathan. This is not something he wanted to do. It's just something that had to be done for justice to be served. Wait, what? I'm saying that, you know, just to see how David handles the post-killing of Saul. Saul's uh, descendants. Yeah. Is that he continues to honor them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not like he's over it. Yeah, it's not like he's... I honored you before. I don't need to keep honoring you. Right. Or it's just your bones. Who cares? Right. Yeah. <laughs> Rod says, in, bu in biblical times, they would cut his mom's head off and go after her son. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Uh, this yeah. Is, this might be but the But I think maybe, but not within their own tribes. That's what the mother of the Israelites was, you know, saying. I am, I'm one of you. I'm your mother. Yeah. I am a mother of an Israel. Why would I'm you hurt me? Mother of your brothers. Exactly. Uh, Beth Murtano, uh, Samuel, 2 Samuel 22, Beth Murtano. I'm sure you all have either been asked or heard the question, what do you want written on your tombstone or in your obituary? Well, when I was reading this verse, 2 Samuel 22, 20. Hold on, hold on. You guys, you got it. You got it. So for those of you watching this video pre-recorded, you just have to ignore the next two minutes of what I'm going to say. When somebody is a troll, if they are trolling, ignore them. By saying they're a troll, you're only going to infuse them. And Mr. or Mrs. Heli Honko, everything that you're saying this channel actually agrees with. So if you're going to troll a channel, you may want to research the theology and the teachings of the channel you're trolling before you leave your comments as if to say that the channel doesn't teach the very thing that you're teaching or saying. So now that we can bring that conversation to an end, let us all get back to the Bible which teaches the very thing, Heli, that you want people to know because you are not the authority nor the two people on this camera that you guys are watching the authority, but the very book in which we are all reading in this entire Bible read through every week is the authority. And all information and anything that anybody needs to know about God can be found in the book that is the authority that we're reading in this video. And if that is something that you have a problem with the theology of, then you can come and you can write me personally about it here at Yeshua Network in a private message. Otherwise, to post it as you are doing is indeed trolling. So now that we can put this all to rest and be adults about it, we can move forward with the rest of the video. Thank you for your time. Okay, go ahead. Because <laughs> I don't like you distracting the people who are trying to focus on God's word. So let's get back to God's word. Second Samuel 22. Go ahead. Beth Martirano. I'm sure you all have either been asked or heard the question, what do you want written on your tombstone or in your obituary? Well, when I read, read this verse, 2 Samuel 22, 20, part of David's song of praise, I was struck with the answer to that very thought, but even more so in everyday life. He rescued me because he delighted in me. Praise Yeshua. Mm -hmm. that, that would be a lovely thing to have written on your tombstone indeed. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Praise Yeshua. He, res he rescued me because he delighted in me. What a great mm -hmm. sentence. Mm -hmm. hmm. All right, Sharon. Sharon Lewis Roberts, uh, Samuel, 2 Samuel 22-39. This is my first time reading it all the way through. When I come across passages like this with names amongst names, I feel like I'm not taking anything in. Does it get any easier when you go through the Bible for the second or fifth time? I hope I'm not the only one who gets confused. Much easier. Yes. But you also still grow and you still learn. Sorry. You keep going. You're nailing it. So go ahead. Well, no. I mean, that's... Well, we... Only because... The only reason why it gets easier is just because you've already done the research and you already have a general idea. But you guys, the Bible is so long. It has so much information. So what we do is we go to charts. We always Google a chart. We always see, or we even have made charts. Like we take pen and paper, where's my notepad? We take a pen and paper and we literally draw out to try to see if we can understand who's who. But because we live in the time and era that we do, you guys, there's you can actually see charts too that they don't agree. And that's the other thing that we do. Like I said, we will find something that looks like what the Bible's saying, something that we think it could be saying, and something that we think it's not saying. We line up all three, and then we'll try to research, like, why do all three different versions, or five versions, or 12 versions, why are there so many versions? And then we'll try to look at the scripture ourselves, go back to it, and try to break it down ourselves to see which one we think is the right. Uh, and maybe we're not right. And like somebody said earlier, there's times where we've kind of just come to the conclusion that we understand 90%, but there's 10% we just don't know because we weren't there. 
And then we'll read later in the Bible that 10% gets answered because somebody who was there gave us, wrote it later. So, you know, the, the, the thing that you're talking about, it's, yeah, it's, to retain all that in your head, you, I don't know, you'd have to be one of those people who can like look at a book one time, one word, and you remember it for all eternity. You know what I'm saying? I totally do. That's not me. So if that's you, God bless we, you. We, we have stumbled around with names as well, and we do, we do know that they're important, though, even though there's so many of them. Mm -hmm. And there's been things we've discovered because we didn't let some names go, and we looked into it and wanted to make sure we connect the right character to the right name, because names do repeat. Uh, some people, you know, there's several characters, several people <laughs> in the story that you encounter with the same name. Mm -hmm. So um, it's good, and... Uh, it's important to get those names uh, right, so we totally get, it, it's not always easy. Mm -mm. Um, What's next, Sharon? Or is that what we just did? That's what, we just did that one. Oh, Samuel, 2 Samuel 23. Um, 2 Samuel 24 now, 23 was. Oh, nobody was, had a comment. Was unloved. Nobody, nobody loves it. <laughs> Ricardo, uh, hi Nathan and Alex, love from Argentina. We love you back. I have a question about 2 Samuel 24, 1. And again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, excuse me, I'm going to sneeze. Pardon me. I'm not the only one it happens to. Oh, it went. It left. As soon as I said it, it left. So far. Uh, going, okay. Uh, I have a question about 2 Samuel 24, 1. And again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, go, number Israel and Judah. My question jumps a little ahead. In Chronicles 1, mm -hmm. Read the following by yourself before reading, for maybe we should talk about it further. In Chronicles 21, 1, and Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel, who moved David to, who moved David to count Israel. This contradiction is explained in Job, that Jehovah allows the enemy to test Job because the whisperer has no power over our father. All three of the things you just said, I believe, are true. So, go ahead. Yeah. All three of the things you're saying, I believe, are true. Um... Uh, he, yeah, he didn't, he didn't, God didn't trick him. He, should we read it for him? Should we do what we did? Yeah, I think we should. Okay. This is important. Let's do yeah, let's do it. Okay, let's go here real quick. This is 24. Yeah, we should do this. Okay, check it out, guys. The wording on this is, is a little tricky. So this is one of those moments, and this is one of those times we had to spend a lot of time with it to really pick this up. Uh, hopefully you guys can see it. And again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel and moved David against them to say, go number Israel and Judah. Okay, if you read this sentence, it sounds like God moved David against them, uh, against them to say, and God is telling him, go number Israel and Judah. God is telling David, go number Israel and Judah. Let's read it again, though, slowly. And, the, and again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel Let's put a period there. Remember, too, that there is, in ancient Hebrew, guys, there was no periods, commas, apostrophes, exclamation marks, question marks. That didn't exist. So what you're reading is an English person had put commas and, and apostrophes and, and things like that in places that they thought it, it, it went. So if we read it this way, which it actually says, and again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, period. That moved David against them to say, against Israel, to say, go number Israel and Judah. So David saw that God was angry. David felt God's anger. His righteous anger of God was in him. He was connected to God in that way. He had like the Spirit, Holy Spirit back then. And so he says to his people, go and number Israel because he's angry because he sees the anger of the Lord. He's mad that God's mad. He's mad that the people have angered God so much. So he, in his anger and his emotional tie to God's anger, acts on his own accord. It does not say that God told David to count the people. So if, if, if you think about it, David just had him and his 600 guys or whatever in the, fort, in the wilderness. They were surrounded by his son, led an army against him. Even Joab says, listen, man, the country's not really happy with you. you. This whole war thing happened. You became king. You won. And now you're like depressed. You need to go out to the people and tell them that you love them to, and rally them to get behind you. And then, and then he sees the anger of the Lord. He's depressed. And what comes after depression usually in the face? Anger, right? And when you mourn somebody. So now he's got this righteous anger in him. And what does he want to do? He wants to go to war with them. 
So why do you do a census? Why did he send Joab to do a census? And Joab even says, let's go to 24, 22. For the king said to Joab, the captain of the host, which was with him, uh, now go now through all the tribes of Israel from Dan even to Beersheba and number ye the people that I may know the number of the people. Let me go to this so you guys can, it's easier for you to read. Uh, four three and Joab said to the king, Now the Lord thy God add on to the people how many soever they be a hundredfold and a hundredfold, and that the eyes of my lord the king may see it. But why doth my lord the king delight in this? So so you have to understand, Joab is picking up like he's trying to figure out why is David all of a sudden really happy? Why is he going to? Uh, be happy about the fact that there's a census being done. Why is he? Why is his motive? The word delight, I have a feeling, is also not exactly a, a, a great translation. Let's take a look at it. Uh, where is delight? There it is. Where? You just king delight a little higher than where you are. A little higher. What's wrong with me? Little, one oh, there, there it is. is. Okay, let's take a look at it, guys. There it is. Is a bad descriptor when staring at a screen. I know. It's really. You didn't even put your <laughs> finger out. Okay. <laughs> Uh, wait, is that, did I click on the right word? Is that how bad it is? No way. To incline. Yeah, see, this is, the word delight here, can you guys see now? It's, that's, delight's one of delight, the Delight, desire, favor, like, move. Like, why, well, why is this your choice? Yeah. Is like, better though. Why are you, yeah, why, why, why are is you this doing the thing this? you're choosing to do? Yeah. Do you see what I mean? So, so then. Why are you favoring this, this mode of action? Option. This option. And what is the option? He's counting them to see how big their army is against his army, against Judah's army. Yeah. Why? Because he's using his mind, he's using his flesh, he's using his own assessment to decide whether and or not... And his power is king. And his power is king to decide whether or not he's going to actually beat them in war. He's, this is not a moment where David's sitting there saying, if the Lord is with me, it's already won. It doesn't matter if I'm 600. It doesn't matter if I'm one guy against a giant. We are actually seeing David make a conscious choice because he's so on fire with a righteous zeal to smite them with his own means. That's the sin. Is He's smiting God's people. This is the one time where the people now, uh, God, David is okay with the idea of smiting them. And then it comes back and we find out that Israel, or yeah, Israel is bigger than Judah. And then he goes, that no, was no, a bad idea. No, Judah is bigger than Israel. Wait, what? Yeah, Judah is like 500,000. And it came to a stronghold in, his, in the highs of the Canaanites, and they went out. And said, the sum of the number of the people onto the king. Where? Oh, uh, uh, don't what? move. <laughs> I don't know where you are. Oh, now. here, let me go back so they can see what we're looking at. Okay. Uh, and Joab gave it the sum of the number of the people onto the king. There were in Israel 800,000 valiant men that drew the sword. In Israel, yeah. The men of Judah, 500,000 men. Why did I have a 300,000 men before? What sort of mental lapse did I enter? Oh, no, we read it together, man. So that's what I was saying. Anyways, my point was correct. Uh, what I was saying is, is that when David got the census back, he realized Judah was outnumbered. What so, is going on with my mind? You focus for one moment. Ugh. So you guys, that's the sin. He was actually wanting to go to war and use his own means and his own his own resources and his own flesh to do what he thought was good for God, just like Joab wanted to do for David. Except this time he was doing it against God. Same okay, same. this is like, uh, this. what's that thing called? What's that effect called? Mandela effect. This feels like the Mandela effect. And we've been talking about South Africa today, so that's interesting. This feels like the Mandela effect, because I swear the first time I read it, when we read it, I remember reading that it was 300,000 men in Israel and that David got when he we essentially realized he could go and win this war and then he felt guilt. We talked about that he wouldn't win. When we read this, we talked about that he wouldn't win. No, I remember talking about that he would win. Wow. This is why it's important to fellowship. Do you see this? Look, I, he, I know I entered another universe today. What is going on here? I was mm -hmm. so sure that we talked about it the other way. Vice versa says it perfectly. Brain farts happen. Thank you yeah, very much. Yeah, I know the whole math that's adds up to one. 3K. I get it. Yeah. So weird. So anyway, weird. It's, I've only been once right in this entire Bible read-through series, and I'm just gonna I'm just going to claim this one that I was right. So, uh, yeah, that's that's the important thing. That's what he happened, guys. God didn't tell him to do this, and then it was a trick. I'm going with the Mandela effect. There's no way he could have been right. 
Will you focus back on this? <laughs> See what I'm this, working with this here? This is what he's working with here. Okay, wh where, where were you? What were you? I don't know. Saying? You're the one who's reading. I'm just responding to the question about this. So, hi, Nathan Alex, this one. Right? Okay, yes. So, it wasn't that, I just want to say that it wasn't that a demon showed up and, and said, I am God, go and count the people. And then David counted the people, and then he realized, oh my gosh, I was lied to by a devil. I shouldn't have counted the people. That's what I'm saying. That's yeah. not what happened. It's just, the English reads very weird and makes us believe that because of how it, it reads and where they put commas and stuff. That's my only point I'm trying to make. Yeah, I mean, if we want to if we want to even look back, David, um, you know, just like happened to Joshua and his people. Uh, Joshua and his people were told to go smite everybody, and they just went and did it, and one day it didn't work, and they were wondering what happened. And it turned out that they had not consulted with God about a particular issue. And so here again, it says, the text says that David was, as Nathan has already explained. I'm just repeating it again. He does that. I do that sometimes. This is Pretty much. Yeah. I'm just summing it down, summing it up. Was I long worded? No, you did right to take everybody through. But I'm going back to the initial uh, statement you made, which is that God didn't say go do it. God uh, David was moved to go do it. Now, if the if Chronicle says Satan came and moved David to go do it, if it's it not that. incorrect because right. David was moved by what? Not by David was moved to do this thing not by God's speech and direct interaction or asking God for his opinion. Okay, right. God, I realize you're angry. I'm angry too. What should I do? No, David was not hearing what he should do and something spoke inside something spoke in his mind that said i should go do this right i am king therefore i can i should me 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 and it would be it would be legit to say then at that in that sense that it was a devil or the devil that tempted him that pushed him that gave him the ideas but what i just wanted to make clear was it wasn't that the person or there was a deity that spoke to David and said, I am God, go and count the people. And David counted the people, then he got the numbers back, and then all of a sudden he realized he sinned. So what you're saying is correct that yes, David could say that his own motivation or what appeared to be his own motivation or the idea to count the people from when he saw God angry could have been from the devil. And right. Thus, well, thus, if another scripture well, says later that the devil tempted him or the spirits yeah. tempted him, it was because it was out of his flesh that he got tempted. Well, it also reveals to us how the devil tempts. This is a perfect example. Exactly. Sorry. Yeah. Ricardo Satan, say, Ricardo, Satan means Satan enemy. Satan means enemy. So the exactly. En so the enemy Literally, could that's tempt you in a way where the you know everybody imagines the enemy tempting. Flesh you know, can like be a enemy. Hollywood exactly like a Hollywood movie. You know the devil with his horns shows up in your room and goes, "I got a contract for you, buddy." Sign right here. That's not how the enemy tempts. David, this this passage right here is actually a clue that the enemy could tempt you through your own righteous zeal. Not even well, yes, the enemy could tempt you through your own yes, your your own ability to figure out a solution to the problem is actually possibly the devil telling you how to solve it. Exactly. That's the point of this of what all I'm trying to say in this case. Yes, very well said. All right, moving on. Yes. Uh, where are we? Here. Yeah, where are we? Here. That really? Okay. Well, look, there was only one other question before. Okay, right. Faunus Prinzlu, Second Samuel twenty four one, and again the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, "Go, number Israel and Judah." If God instructed both Israel and Judah to be counted by David, why did David repent? So we just talked about that. Mm -hmm. Maybe Exodus thirty twelve was the reason that David taken God's nation as his own. Then in Chronicles 21 states that Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to, to number Israel. So you guys are awesome. You guys are obviously looking at and doing, doing the same it. process. You're doing the work. Uh, we hit something we don't understand. We start looking around. We find that, that it's in Chronicles. One of the things we thought long ago uh, about this particular moment was that David didn't take a tithe, which is what you're supposed to do when you number Israel. When you do a census. When you do a census. So maybe that's true as well. We don't, but that's... Uh, we, we feel like that's not the main point here, but it could be also a feature of it. Who yeah. knows? And and Ricardo says an, uh, a thing that I, I, I just couldn't agree with more, and I say it all the time. When you read the Bible and realize how much you've been taught is wrong, it's unbelievable. Yeah. When you read it for yourself, you're like, wow, I have been totally under the belief that this is the case, that this is what it says, because that's what I've always been taught. I mean, I don't know. I can't tell you how many churches I've gone into where the pastors actually have like, it's like they're reading from a script. They all say the same thing and come to the same conclusion about a topic. 
and then you read the Bible and it clearly doesn't say that and doesn't come to that conclusion. Yeah. You know? And you're like, <laughs> like wh who's the first one that taught this and why is everybody buying this hook, line, and sinker? So that is exactly why here at Yeshua Network, for those of you who are new, we say read the Bible for yourself and that's why this Bible study is the way it is. Amen? Amen. Booyakara. Okay. Uh, Doreen um, Anderson, 24, 15 through 17. Wow, the power of angels. One angel struck 70,000 with a plague. But when the angel approached Jerusalem, the Lord was grieved and said, Enough, and the angel stopped. Verse 17 says, David saw the angel and said, I am the one who sinned. Strike me and my family. But it appears to me that the angel withdrew his hand prior to David seeing the angel. So was it David's request? that grieved the Lord to stop the plague or his love for Jerusalem or perhaps both? Did David actually see the angel or just the calamity? Well, when we read it, we kind of said, whoa, he actually yeah, saw, he the, saw angel, the angel I think, and he spoke to the angel and it was kind of like, oh, and then this happened, like in about half a paragraph or something. Uh, that sounds so like massive, you know, an encounter with an angel who's... Yeah. It was as massive as those encounters in Exodus that, that the Israelites had. Right. And, um, you know, it's just a reminder. I think, I, I think it's just a reminder that, hey, you know, Exodus could happen tomorrow. Mm -hmm. The miracles of Exodus, the craziness that was going on, the magic, all that stuff could happen again. And they're due here and they happen. And it's just kind of matter of factly told about. Yeah. Um, what else to say about that we think that he actually saw the angel yeah i think to answer the first part of your question i think that god stopped it before david saw it although why would the angel stay around if the god was if god said stop well i mean david had to be witness to the fact that all of this was from god yeah that, that there's just so just to make sometimes i think I, I, all the time i think that this kind of stuff happens so that there's no confusion if God said this will happen, God said through a prophet, choose your calamity. David chose, and then David went and saw the angel performing the calamity. Mm -hmm. And Aguchukua, I know I'm murdering your name, I apologize. Uh, we, we agree with you, and we actually do a whole video on that. You, I don't know where it is, but I'm sure if you go through our videos, you will see uh, a title on that. And yes, we actually agree with you, and we do cover that topic, so thank you. Sorry. Brian Manning, in the last days they will teach doctrines of devils. That is why reading on our own for ourselves is so important. Amen. Gosh. And yet some people get pissed if you teach that people should read the entire Bible for themselves. Who would get mad at believers reading the entire Bible for themselves? I don't know what you're talking about. I've never done that. Did you? I wasn't even talking about you. What? Today is Everything's About Alex Day. What? Of course. What? What? <laughs> How is it any different than any other day? Wait, did you ever get mad about people reading the whole Bible? No, I'm just kidding. Well, well I, I, I was. Uh, we had a discussion about it. I wanted to know at the time that we had the discussion. I wanted to understand why you were so passionate about it. Oh, because you hadn't read it yet. Because I hadn't read it yet. Right. Right. All right. Um, is there a lesson in that? The, you see, there there was a time when I argued with him about it, right? So that is to say that I am not special. I have just had the experience of reading it, and now I know different. Okay, where were we? Ah. Linda Eli, is that where we are? Mm -hmm. Okay, Linda Eli, 2 Samuel 24. Mm -hmm. This chapter is about David's sin regarding the numbering of the people. It's a bit confusing because verse 1 states that the Lord moved or incited David to do so. What is the manner in which David did so that was the sin since the Bible clearly states that God does not tempt us to sin? After a bit of research, Chronicles 21 says that Satan, or an adversary, did the inciting against David. So if that's the case, like in the case of Job, why doesn't 2 Samuel 24 1 say this instead of saying the God did the inciting? Um, well, because God's ultimately responsible. He's the ultimate authority, and God does say that in Job. He says, don't give credit to the devil for this. Don't give credit to the devil for that. When the disaster came, when the tornado came, when the hurricane came, all these things, I did it. Who controls the lightning? Who tells it where to strike? Who tells the sun where to rise? Who tells the ocean where to meet the shore? God goes very clear that he says, I'm responsible for everything. And there is other passages that we've already read here in the Old Testament where it says that God did test them, that God hardened the heart of Pharaoh. God gets involved. 
If, it's, if it influences or affects God's overall arc of the story of humanity, he absolutely gets involved. And he also will indeed get involved if it affects the salvation of his people. And, and he has left that door open. If you look at the Levitical laws, if you look at what rules he puts down with uh, Moses in, in Leviticus and Deuteronomy and Numbers, that in that area, God basically says, if I'm not for you, everything's against you. But if I am for you, nothing. nothing is against you. And since God is the one who stated that, and therefore anything that God states is law, then it is God that brings the wrath. And remember too, there was many times that, that the Israelites did not have to even raise their swords for an entire village to be destroyed. It was God who destroyed them. And that ties in, of course, with Leviticus 20, 29, 27, right? 27, yeah. 27, 29, yeah. I don't know. My dyslexia kicked in. I don't have dyslexia. You get my point. So... Um, that's it, it, there's these things can be confusing again too. But I would look at the original words that are used when it says tempt or you know uh, to stumble or th whatever these words are. Look at look at the original words that are actually used and see exactly how it's worded because the English translation I've noticed I can't recall and I I, I don't have the, these things memorized to this degree of course. But there are certain passages where the translation is not exactly accurate, like we showed today in one of the passages we quoted earlier in this video. I think this particular moment in the Bible is like many other moments where you get pieces of information about an event from different places and they all kind of, they all show you all the various different sides of an event. Mm -hmm. They don't contradict each other because if you look carefully at the text, it doesn't actually exclude. They don't exclude each other. They're not mutually exclusive. Right. But they add layers to the event and add extra understanding to the event. Exactly. So I believe it is very much on purpose. We believe that moments like this are very much on purpose where the Bible gives you one little nugget here and another nugget there to bring full full fusion of, of it later or at some point when all pieces of, of that information, all the different sides of that event are pieced together in one, could, in, in your mind. Could one say that it's almost a trap by God in a, in a way, and, and, and hear me out on this before all the haters out there, who oh, said it's a trap by God? Uh, we've already learned that there's traps by God. But could it be that it's a, te it's a form of a test by God that if you only read part of the Bible, you're actually going to have misunderstanding? And if you read the totality of the Bible, because it will fill in the blanks and will give you full understanding and clarity, that that's the reason for it. That he says, I'm going to put a piece here, and I'm going to put a piece here at the end, and if you never make it from here to there, you'll never get those two pieces together. Could it be that he did that intentionally? I am persuaded it is so. How about you? I am persuaded. Oh, dang. Two people I am are persuaded. I am super persuaded. Well, there's two, two people who are in agreement with that one. The Bible is like the yellow brick road. It will get you to a destination that is wonderful and glorious, that at the end of which lies salvation. But you can't get there if you skip a step, if you go off the road, if you turn someplace else, or if you never finish walking. So, you know, I mean, what I'm trying to say here is that... We represent the Lollipop Guild. <laughs> exactly. Thank you Straight for face. bringing it. Straight face. Thank you for bringing it back to what I was really getting at. Okay, okay. sorry. Thorrod, good morning, Nathan and Alex. My questions, my questions are, are the Palestine today have a relation with the Philistine? No, I believe no. I Google it already, but I would like to know your opinion. My second question is also in the last chapter of 24. And he incited David against them, saying, Go and take census of Israel and Judah. As I noticed, he is not the God that commanded him. Right. I think, Thor, if what you're saying is what you're saying, then we just said it. Yep, yeah, exactly. So we're in agreement with you. But no, the Philistines are were not a... Um, Relation to the Phil pa Palestine. They were not, yeah, they were not an Ishmaelite, Arabic sort of kingdom they were actually something Phoenician which would be Greek more Greek mm -hmm. good um, question though yeah and their names are so similar that I thought of it too I, 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 yeah, when I first I, I was like is this the same thing Palestine Palestine yeah. Palestine Palestine yeah it seemed very similar but no it's just it's just maybe they carry on the name so well, close it's, now it's a different name but it's to fit the prophecy yeah of what would happen to the Israelites if they did not right. do what they were supposed to do with the Philistines but Really quick, too, on the topic we were talking about with God, let us also just remember the passage, too, that it says very clearly in the Bible multiple times that a good father chastises their kid. 
And then when a kid's getting chastised, it never seems loving. It never seems good. But there, we have we have two generations in this world right now, and I, especially in the first world countries, where you have kids who have never been chastised, and they're perceived as just rotten beings. And then you have a generation that was totally chastised before laws were made where parents weren't allowed to chastise them, and they have a sense of respect and uh, for their elders and for other people, and have manners and things like that. And uh, the Bible even talks about that. If you don't reprimand your children, they will go out of control and they will have no respect and they will have no good moral. So it's like, I just want to say too that what we perceive to sometimes be is like these horrific events or these things that are bad that are happening to us. How many times have you looked back in your own life and go, wow, I'm glad that that happened. Even even a bad thing, right? So just 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 a little add, additive I want to throw on there. Okay. Last one, Ricardo? Uh, Ricardo, general question. Uh, is it counting Israel by David's order wrong because it implies that he's counting David's people and not Jehovah's people? I'm finally going to see. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Sorry, I hope that wasn't so horribly loud and busted your eardrums. You are the quietest male sneezer I've ever heard in my life. Is that right? Yeah, you're strangely quiet. I'm kind of scared. Uh, I'm, I'm scared able right to. Don't know if I can trust I, a man that sneezes that quiet. I have, you know, um, what what are those things called that you put on? Forget. A silencer. You know, uh, yes. You have a you silencer know, sneeze. I have a silencer in my face. I don't know how to respond to this, you guys. This is this is what I'm working with here. When the camera's off, this is what I have to work with. Well, when the camera's on, this is what you have to. Yeah, but at least I do not change. By the way, mm. did you hear everybody on the other side of the camera say "bless you"? Oh, thank you, guys. Yes, now I hear it loud. I heard there. it. I know you guys said it. Bless they're, you, they're, Alex. They're, they're saying it. Bless you, bless you. Oh, look at that. See? They're saying it. See? Thank you, guys. Also, there's a delay. Yes. So when you sneezed, yes, it was, I knew it was coming. You you prophesied. Don't, don't also, tell me Father you Father should not prophesy. Oh, no, I use, oh, yeah, I use my brain. I'm not, listen, you have to define. If you say <laughs> that the Lord told you and he didn't tell you, uh-uh, I ain't making that mistake. Don't don't try to get me to stumble uh, there, Alex. I just you know a little tempting here and there. Mm. All right, you guys, listen. We are so blessed. Did we answer Ricardo's question, or do we yeah. just spend the time talking about no. my sneezing? Well, maybe we didn't answer it directly, but I think we already answered it. Right. What 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 was what was wrong with him? Yeah. Counting the people? answer is yes. You are correct, but that wasn't the real the the reason was the motive behind why he was counting Israel and his own people. But it does listen. One thing we got to be clear is it doesn't actually in the text say his motive. It doesn't. We are inferring it. We are feeling it's implied. We are, you know. You decide. It could be just that alone. Yeah. But um, so that's there may be to other bring clues later on. Plagues. There might be. Yeah. But we don't. We definitely know that he took an action based on his own thinking. It does tell us, though, how many fighting men. Right. It's the a clue. census. The census is only fighting men. It doesn't say women with children. Right. It doesn't say definitely. children are this. It doesn't say elders. He comes back a with clue. a census that clearly says this is how many fighting men of age, and this is how many fighting men of fighting it, age. It, it, so if the census is about fighting age, right? It's, they're it's, not building automobiles. <laughs> they're not. Oh, I they're, totally thought they were going to build cars. The plan wasn't to make shoes. Really? So, no. Oh, you're blowing my mind right now. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I got nothing. It's else. a good thing that we don't actually lead this Bible study. You guys do. You guys. You guys does. do. I mean, look at the most amazing, most wonderful mic drop and comments we received today. By the way, I love you. You guys are awesome. You're, yeah. you're wonderful people. And you guys did a great job. Your comments are amazing. And for those of you who are first-time commenters, thank you. We really, really welcome you, and we're really, really glad that you did because your comments were amazing today, too. So yeah. very, very blessed by this. A lot of things going on here at Yeshua Network as we wrap up this video today. We want to tell you that we have group pages. You can just type this into your, your text box uh, here, and you can actually look at the uh, description of this video. You will see links to those group pages in this description. Uh, we have a prayer group where you can post a prayer request, and you'll get responses from the body of Christ in real time. It is a private page, so your prayer requests won't be seen by your friends and your family. It won't be shared by anybody. And we also have a testimonial, so if you want to give a testimony on the page, you want to even make a video and share your testimony in video, you can do that other than just written text. And, uh, and you can inspire a lot, a lot of people. Um, if you are new to Yeshua Network, we try to provide an atmosphere for you to have ministry. 
for you to follow the commandments of Yeshua and be his disciple, to feed his sheep and gather his sheep and feed his sheep as we're all commanded to do. And so um, we also have a group called Hashtag Be The Light on the 22nd of every month, which is what you're going to see here at the bottom. Uh, hashtag Be The Light is a thing that we do uh, where we light a candle on the 22nd of every month just to stand in unity with brothers and sisters all around the world. So we hope that you will join these three groups. We hope that you will participate in them. And of course, we also have a group called Yeshuans, uh, which is just type in Yeshuans uh, on Facebook search engine and you will see the group pop up. It will have a yellow, blue, and white logo uh, in the name of Yeshua. And that is us. And yeah. We, uh, we hope that you will join that too. Where you, that's a place where you get to kind of post all sorts of things. That's an open group. The other three are not. So uh, I love you guys. I love you guys too. Thank you for all your comments, your participation. This mm. is amazing. And we got through another book. That's right. Kind of seems like they go fast now. Are we reading some shorter books? That's probably why. Well, maybe. But maybe it does seem like just... it's going fast. I, mm. I like it. It's not going fast. We have five years ahead of us. But <laughs> it seems like it's going faster. But yes, you guys, be blessed, be the blessing. And also, we hope to see you on the tour. I'm going to be posting this afternoon. Uh, not only the, the names of the cities we I will be stopping at, and many of you have asked, is Alex going to be there? The answer is that hopefully Alex will come and meet us at certain locations when he has the availability. Uh, but I'm the one, unfortunately, who's just going to be doing the tour. Um, unfortunately. And, well, I'm by myself. It would always be blessed oh. if there was more people. Oh, I see. Because it is not unfortunate that you are doing the no, tour. No, only. I think only I'm. Oh, it's unfortunate only I am. It would be nice if the whole world came with us, wouldn't it? If we all toured the whole world together, it would be weird because we're already here. Why do we have to move? <laughs> Don't overthink it, guys. Anyways, the point is the list of the 75 stops will be listed along with a map and the seasons in which we will be stopping at, we, I, will be stopping at those locations. So there should be a location, if you're in the United States or Canada, where you should be no further than about four hour drive at the absolute farthest, most likely an hour to two hour drive at the absolute uh, most, in most, most cases. So be blessed, be the blessing. Thank you guys very much. We will talk to you soon. And remember, share these videos. Let people know that there is an actual entire Bible read through where somebody uh, can actually read the Bible for themselves, but they're not reading it alone. I think that's a very, very powerful tool that we together are creating here on the interwebs. Amen. All right. Talk to you soon. Amen.